Thank you for the reminder. I had just hit the little triangle. Thank you. Yep. Good to go now, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Great. Well, with that, um, we will um, I come back to public comment later if anyone joins us, but uh, we'll get started with the March 18th budget committee or finance committee um, workshop. And the first um, um, item on the agenda tonight is Portland Headlights. So this is uh, department eight or fund code 870 and fund 70 for the Port Museum Portland Headlights. Um, Jean, do you want to take it away? Sure. Um, well, it was a little difficult making this um, budget because there's so many unknowns this year. Um, the prediction of doing this in January, um, the vaccine uh, um, wasn't rolling out as smoothly as it is now. So I didn't know that there would be that much um, tourist interest uh, coming this year. So still don't know about that either. So everything's a little bit less in the budget um, because it probably won't be open as long this year because we don't have any cruise ships. We probably won't have any foliage buses. So it's a little bit of a shorter time span for the shop and the museum. And the other thing that affects the budget is the capacity, the customer capacity in the shop is only five and in the museum is only 10. So it cuts down on a lot of the sales and admissions. So. Um, welcome, Jamie. Um, and I, I guess I'll pause there and see if any counselors have questions for, for Jean or Matt uh, about this budget item. Just uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would agree with Jeannie. I know, uh, you know last year being uh, as chaotic as it was and this year being still unsettled, I think uh, you know, this is a best, uh, a best case estimate uh, due to the timing that we are at at the present time uh, regarding our sales. Uh, you know, we did curtail uh, operations considerably this year as well as a result of, uh, as a result of the pandemic and its influences. So uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that uh, you know, as the vaccine does come out that we end up seeing you know, we, we may see much more traffic on the on that day tripper side of it, uh, but yeah, Gene's spot on as far as limitations. Until those numbers are changed, as far as occupancy, uh, she she does have a, uh, I guess you could say a governor on her, uh, <laughs> pardon the pun, but a governor on, on her yeah. capacity that she can allow within the within her facilities. But I think this is our, our, the best estimate based on Gene's long experience with us. So uh, I'm grateful that she she brought this forward and good to have her here tonight. Jamie. Um, Matt, I know that there's no cruise ship activity. Have you been hearing anything about other tour bus or just sort of group, um, you know, group traffic? Um, there, there are only four buses so far that have um, made reservations. Okay. We have noticed that there's you know, you're starting to see more increases in in uh, travel. You know, options. I've seen uh, there's a couple of different list uh, list serves that I'm on that kind of send notifications for seniors and different trips uh, with reduced capacity. But uh, yeah, we are looking at probably year two of a of a, of a starkly diminished uh, route. You know, you never if we see that um, people start to get more confident as the as the season goes on. We obviously have the capacity to do that with just four reservations at the present time. Uh, the trolley itself is, is also a wild card as far as uh, if they will be coming on. I, I think we may see that later in the summer uh, if that if that comes around, but that a lot of that is re is related uh, strongly to the cruise ship industry and and that, that loop from Portland to over here. So All right, well, if there are no further questions, um, thank you, Jean, for pulling the budget together. And I think we will move on to Jay Reynolds, Director of Public Works. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jean. Jean. 
Great, thank you very much. And thank you for the finance committee uh, for the opportunity to present the uh, budgets relating to public works. Uh, I'll just say uh, in general, uh, no major changes to the public works budgets. And that also includes the recycling center and also the parks and grounds budgets. Uh, no major operational changes proposed in FY22 in comparison to FY21. Uh, so I can uh, oh, I'm sorry go. to interrupt. Um, sure. If you don't mind, if you could give us a page number where you're starting from, that'd be helpful. Absolutely. Yes, I am uh, at 310. Uh, Public Works is on page 111. And uh, I, I'll go through 310, I guess, uh, rather quickly, just a high level, uh, unless you'd like me to give um, specific detail. As you know, Public Works handles operations for um, roads and right of ways, uh, maintaining our storm drain systems, uh, you know, management of uh, pavement curbing, esplanade sidewalks, and everything else uh, that no one else wants to do. <laughs> so uh, with regards to the 310 budget, uh, generally speaking, uh, overall in summary at the bottom, you'll see a 2% increase from uh, current fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. Uh, generally speaking, there were some minor tweaks uh, up and down uh, with regards to certain individual line items. I uh, was able to save some money on fuel expenses uh, for the upcoming fiscal year for not only this department, for all of the users of the fuel. And um, had to increase a few just based on uh, historical spending, I would say. And, uh, you know, there's, I think, maybe the potential that some of these uh, operating budgets were, were cut um, maybe this fiscal year due to COVID and uh, really just looking to get some of these line items uh, back to where they, they were historically as far as spending goes. The only specific uh, thing I wanted to point out uh, too, actually, one is the full-time payroll. You'll see a 4% next to that one at the very top of the 310 budget. <clears throat> and I just wanted to call out that the um, salary increases are, there's a placeholder for 2%. <clears throat> the reason why you see four there is because there were several employees where their salaries were mixed into other budgets like solid waste, um, parks and grounds, uh, Riverside Cemetery, um, and the sewer budget. And I realigned some of the percentages of those positions back into public works. So you'll see a higher number in public works, but you'll see a lower than two number in some of the other budgets. So it's just a little bit of movement there. Uh, the other specific account I wanted to just mention is the 303039, which is our MS4 program. And MS4 is an acronym for Municipally Separated Storm Sewer Systems. So it's just easier to say MS4, uh, but that's our stormwater program. And uh, I know in the past, uh, the town has sort of sidetracked at the budget meetings to just mention the stormwater program. Um, we're obligated under our permit to educate new uh, elected officials uh, of our stormwater program. So uh, we use this opportunity to just make mention to it and uh, at the same time provide two pages of narrative just on the stormwater program so that you have that information uh, if you wish to get uh, more educated on the program. I would also like to thank a few of you for attending one of the stormwater webinars that, that came and went about a month ago. So I appreciate um, your time. I know your time is precious, so uh, that's another uh, check in the box that we can do to make sure we're, we're meeting our permit requirements with the DEP, so thank you. I'll stop there if, you, if you'd like to ask any questions with regards to the 310, or I could keep going. Just let me know. Uh, thanks, Jay, and thanks for uh, spelling out the acronym. I've been listening to these budget sessions for several years, and I don't know that I could have spit that out. So. Um, do, do, do anyone have questions on 310 before we move on to other budget items? Yeah, Valerie. Um, first of all, Jay, I wanna welcome you. This is um, your first time presenting a budget. It looks great, thank you. And you um, stepped into this position during the pandemic and you've made it all so seamless, the transition seamless. So thank you so much, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. 
And before um, Bob talked to us about the schedule that he had for replacing vehicles, top loaders, everything. Can you talk a little bit about that for our new members and um, people that are joining us? Sure. So it's pretty pretty common to have a what's called an equipment replacement schedule. Um, vehicles and equipment all have uh, differing lifespans. Uh, typically, a dump truck will last you 12 to 15 years. Uh, so what you know, the former director did, and what I did in, in my previous town is you you outline those, uh, you know, sort of in a spreadsheet format and put them on a timeline and and try to try to hit those replacement um, schedules. You know, when when those those equipments reach the end of their life cycle. And uh, so we have an equipment replacement schedule here in Cape. And uh, part of the capital, part of the changes on the capital is trying to, to, to hit those target points uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, our loaders aren't going beyond 18 to 20 years or dump trucks are not exceeding 15 years. Uh, when you do start exceeding those, what happens is you start spending more money on on uh, maintenance and um, equipment repairs uh, start to escalate pretty quickly. So that's that's uh, that's equipment replacement schedule 101. Uh, and I can certainly give more detail as to um, Cape's uh, specific equipment um, when we talk about capital. That was, uh, as I mentioned, one of the tweaks that I did to the capital was to try to to get those replacements on, back on. Uh, schedule. Thank you. Gretchen? Thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could just uh, explain a little bit about the this overtime line and, and just I assume it's plowing and things like that, but I just didn't know because that's enough to fund a couple positions. So I didn't know if that's just has to do with when you have to use people or what that's situation is? Sure. Uh, overtime covers several things. Um, it cover, covers special events that happen on weekends or after hours. Uh, that's the probably the smallest piece of it. We, we also have uh, an allowance for employees to be on call 24-7. Uh, so that does provide um, for employees uh, for each week through the course of the year. Uh, all four seasons to be on call. So if we have a school bus that comes back from uh, from an away game and they break down, uh, we can get a mechanic in and um, that, that serves that purpose. The majority of the overtime uh, is based on winter operations and that, that is the largest driver of that account. Uh, so I, I think historically we've budgeted for, you know, 15 to 20 storms and you know, if, if we have a winter like this, uh, that I look good. And, uh, you know, if we have a, a crazy main winter, not so much. Uh, so that, that number will certainly, as far as the spending goes, uh, fluctuates dependent on the weather. Super, that's helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Great, Penny? Yes, um, my question is, uh, and I didn't know we were gonna get into the CRT stuff at this point in time, but, uh, and you can either answer it now or ponder it and answer it when we get there. What equipment trade-offs would you make based on the whole uh, schedule of um, uh, equipment um, uh, purchases you have on um, the list for public works? Sure. I can uh, certainly go down the list of, of those pieces of equipment. I believe they're in the uh, 715 uh, section, or excuse me, they're yeah. in the 2000s now, actually. My apologies. And uh, I know that the most important one for this department is the loader backhoe. That, that piece of equipment uh, is approaching its end of year, end of cycle. Uh, but more importantly, from what I was told is that that purchase was um, that loader backhoe that we have, they discontinued it the year after we purchased it. And usually when you, when you hear of a discontinuance, that means, you know, it's not the best piece of equipment. Um, so I think that's part of the problem. And I, I know historically that piece of equipment has been um, chronically uh, down and, and not operating uh, because of equipment breakdowns. So, I guess as far as priority goes, that would be the number one. 
there are a few others that were deferred from FY21 that are just being pulled forward into FY22. Uh, one is the dump body, the other is a uh, pickup truck. That's the one I drive. Um, let's see, there's a, tra I, be I believe this trailer was also deferred. Uh, and the other two are purchases that were planned to be um, included in FY22. That would be the um, grounds maintenance equipment and the utility tractor. Okay, can you explain to me about the utility tractor and what, uh, what that's all about and what it gives us for $50,000? That is uh, one of our larger pieces of equipment on the parks side of things, uh, side of the house. So that is used to maintain uh, Fort Williams Park, um, some of the uh, athletic fields, Gullcrest, and all of the school campus. Uh, so it does, it does a variety of things. It has a variety of attachments. Uh, it can mow, it can lift, it can move uh, various materials and equipment. So that's generally speaking what it does. What's the age of the equipment right now and does it still serve that purpose? Uh, that particular one? Yeah, because it says replacement. Okay. If I might, I might have to pull up a, another spreadsheet to, to obtain that's that. And, and if that's okay, I can, I can get that before we get to uh, the 2000s. Yeah, I think that's maybe... This, this, if you don't mind, Penny, I think we, we may have some other discussion around the CIP items um, when we get there a little bit later on. Would it be okay? Well, that's what, I, that's what I asked our town manager of whether we wanted to wait for Penny to ask all the questions then or do it now. So I was more than willing to wait. But uh, anyway, I will, I, I will cool my jet. How's that? That, that works for, I think for right now, I'll give Jay a chance to pull up that information as well. Um, Jamie, did you have a question on the three tens? Uh, first, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Jay, thanks so much for uh, your work in pulling this together. Um, hope everything's going well for you so far in the role. Um, so uh, my broken record um, plea is for more of the um, passive speed uh, uh, indicators like we have on 77 heading up towards Hillway and on Shore Road. I know that that's something that um, you kind of work on with the um, police chief uh, as well. So um, if there's uh, these are these are small things, but um, I think they've made a big difference in uh, you know people um, driving more safely and, and to the speed limit around town. So I'd love to see a little bit um, more deployment of those. And I'm not sure which of the line items that falls under, whether it's the traffic or street signage or, or what have you. And then one other thing I had made mention to Matt, I, I was comparing actuals to budget. So maybe the numbers don't bear it out, but I feel like um, both guardrails and specifically the, the um, flashing crosswalk indicator at, Fort, uh, at the top of the hill by Fort Williams, by the secondary entrance. Um, for a number of years now, we seem to be replacing at least one of those. It gets typically gets clipped by either a car or a, a snowplow. And then uh, the wooden railing that's, um, uh, that goes along uh, by the shore road path as you go up from Dyer Pond Road and stuff like that. So whatever whatever is necessary to make sure that there's enough in the budget for that um it, it just seems like more and more those those are in need of maintenance though like i said i i don't see the actuals necessarily bearing that out but one of the things i had discussed with matt just in a casual conversation was next time we go to replace any of those flashing um stanchions whether or not um there might be um a need based on how many times we've had to replace them to put maybe some bollard protection around those um such that um, we're not having to replace them as frequently. So two very minor things, but um, since they're at this point of the accounts associated with this point of the budget, I thought I'd bring it up to you. Sure, and I'd, I'd be happy to work with the police chief and, and maybe get some thoughts uh, on some specific locations for those, um, those speed flashing uh, indicators. 
I, I agree. They work great. They slow me down on 77. So I, I think they, they do a good job. So be I think they've been to... well received too. Everybody likes the thumbs up that yeah. they give when you're do, doing it right. So it's a, a nice little smiley face for your guys. So. Always a positive message. I, I agree. Yeah. The kids Thanks, in the backseat point out when you don't get it too. <laughs> yes. So does my so does my teen permit driver. So when he, when he's riding shotgun with me. Yeah, and uh, and to your question too, Jamie. Yet uh, Jay and I have had a couple of conversations regarding. The, uh, the, the flashing uh, pedestrian crossing that, that is a casualty of storms on occasion. Uh, and then the other part would be, uh, he does get my, uh, my shore road report every time I run down there and I come across a fractured piece of, uh, of guardrail. So I try that to- Is it me or is that happening it. more? And I don't know, part of it could just be where, right? I mean, that's been up for a while. I mean, I know some of it's from impact and some of it might just be from, from where too, but it just, I feel like every time I drive by there now there's like one, one portion that's either been damaged or or is, is missing altogether. I think it's a combination of the both. Yeah. Uh, some of those are older pieces that they just tend to get brittle and then uh, break away, and yeah. then uh, and then we just want to replace them as we come. Yeah, he, he does get my my shore road report <laughs> on a regular basis. So I think we just Thanks. replaced one this week too. So yeah, what, the one from winter time. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that those uh, flashing crosswalk beacons are in a very precarious location and um, they definitely need more protection or need to be relocated in the future. Great, thanks. Thank you. Great. Any other questions on the, the 310? So sort of the, the, I guess I'll call it the core public works um, portion of the budget. If not, um, and if there are, we can come back to them. Um, I, Jay, do you want to take us on to the 320s? Be happy to. Thank you. And this is on page 123. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so Department Code 320 is recycling and refuse disposal. That covers our operational costs associated with the recycling center and also the annual household hazardous waste day. Uh, generally speaking, the majority of those funds are for the management of materials, um, transport, collection transport, and recycling slash disposal methods. Not much change uh, overall in the program. Um, I have been looking at some oper excuse me, operational changes, but uh, not ready to roll anything out just yet um, as far as improving uh, circulation and things of the like that I've been looking into, talking to Matt about a little bit, uh, and maybe finding other ways to uh, dispose of house, household hazardous waste um, through extended producer responsibility type programs, uh, which are free to the residents. Uh, so those are some things that I'm looking ahead uh, beyond FY22 at in the future, uh, but nothing reflected in this, current, in this uh, budget proposal for FY22. Um, so uh, I guess the only thing of note really is um, there was a slight increase in the tipping fees at Eco Maine. They went up from $73 to $75.50 per ton. Uh, we have enough in the budget that pays for that, which is the 2012 Eco Maine fees, uh, already budgeted in there to um, absorb that increase. Um, so I've looked at the historical spending and it appears no change in the budget number is necessary to cover that, that increase. Uh, I've reached out to several of our vendors and our uh, haulers. They're all pretty much willing to uh, continue uh, their operations and their recycling costs uh, at our present costs. So really no changes uh, or increases uh, on the private contractual side of things as far as this goes. The only increase I did uh, put in for was the Household Hazardous Waste Day event. Uh, we spent that and then some on last November's and that was primarily, well, it's due to two things. One, COVID. Uh, two, it was deferred a year. So I think we went 18 months without an event. So we saw a, uh, a very large uh, a turnout <laughs> at that event. And I don't know, we may have had a regional household hazardous way event uh, back in November, if I had to guess too. So we may have had some outside uh, participation as well. So um, 
Again, I, I think we're going to have it again this November. So we would keep it annually. Uh, we had it last November. So we we'll try to keep it in a 12 month cycle. At some point, uh, we'd like to get back to the May uh, time frame with household hazardous waste. But uh, just seeing what happened last November, I think we'll just plan on sticking with a one year cycle and, and have it this November. And uh, that additional cost should cover uh, that. I don't expect we'll end up spending all of that, but that is just uh, in the event that uh, there's lots of painting going on uh, in the residential side in Cape. So that's about all I have. Uh, it's it's almost a net zero, just about $1,600 over um, fiscal year 21 in summary. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. Any questions on the 320s? Hey, Jay. Um, I'd love to see more in the like printing and advertising side. Just, um, you know, every bit of waste that goes into the recycling container or into the food waste bins saves us money. And, um, you know, for the people who money is a, a line item, that might be a motivator for them letting people know that it's there, um, continuing to reinforce breaking down your boxes and um, how to recycle property properly, all those things. And then something that Penny brought up during our goal setting stuff was really about stop trashing Cape, don't leave your trash on the ground, you know, clean up days, things like that. So I'd love to see that reflected in the budget so we have money to spend to make those objectives happen. Absolutely. And as you know, we have a, a great recycling committee who uh, is continuing to to um, push for those things. Um, I, I do recall that there's there is actually a separate budget in the 1000s. Um, it might be under Matt's budget that um, does go towards additional um, printing and re recycling committee related printing and advertising costs. So there may be another number that that's applicable to that. And uh, we're certainly here to support the, the committee because they're they're really pushing to keep the contamination rates low, which is um, Cape's been great They're They've been probably one of the better communities in the region as far as contaminating uh, the recycling stream. And uh, yeah, there are certainly other ways that we can we can start improving uh, the efficiency at the recycling center and, and educating the public uh, as best we can. If I may, Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, I would agree with Jay. We we do have funds available in uh, in my 110 uh, account as well to supplement that as we need it. Or, and there's other, uh, you know, if if we need to expand that, we definitely have the bandwidth there uh, in order to get there. Thank you. Penny? Sorry, I'm trying not to drive and zoom at the same time. I don't want Paul Fenton after me. Um, so my question is because, and, and, um, and I know it could have been somewhat of an anomaly, but I had heard issues prior to this and I, and I often hear people talking about the inefficiencies at the, uh, um, cycling center, the dump, uh, of, uh, the flow of traffic the number of people they're staffing it all of those things have you because you're a newbie and you you, you get to kind of observe it as a uh, outsider looking in have you seen any places where we could gain efficiencies in that operation um certainly on the collection side there are there are other programs like i mentioned that that may be free uh to the consumer that you know like the extended producer responsibility that we can we can collect materials on a more regular basis and not rely on the household household hazardous waste day program. So that's one one efficiency that I, I'm thinking of. As far as operational efficiencies, um, you know, I'd like to see the the queuing lanes used a little uh, more, and you know, use Spurwink Ave a little less to queue up on. So, if you're referring to that type of operational efficiencies, yeah, I've certainly been observing that's that. Exactly. And, you're okay exactly yeah so I, I am i'm working on that i am trying to develop a plan i i just didn't want to change something and then have uh the the negative ripple effect happen um so i really want to absorb uh every little piece of of what we do up there how often we have to collect 
trash and recycling, uh, what days they pick up, uh, you know, when is it full, how, how quickly do things fill up on Fridays, and, and really get into the specifics of it before I make a, a monumental change to something. Okay, okay, okay. Do you think there are staffing implications to that? I don't think so. Um, we have two full-time and one part-time up there for the majority of, of the days that they're open. And, and that, that seems to be uh, sufficient. You know, when we open the swap shop back up, we'll, we'll need volunteers as the town has done in the past um, to manage that. So I think that model works pretty well up there. Okay, great, thank you. And, and, and Councilor Jordan, thank you. That, that's also an expansion from where we were uh, Three years ago, from the from the original model, we have added uh, added hours as well uh, during that time period. So um, we have adapted there, and uh, I will say, thankfully, we've had the, the crew that we have up there has been uh, pr very productive. And as uh, as Jay had said, our recycling numbers look great up there as far as our contamination in the bins. Uh, uh, but yeah, the uh, the queuing conversation, Jay and I have had that. Uh, I, I went over to have a first-hand look at it myself and saw some of our good line folks out there uh, directing traffic and uh, Jay was on it then. So that was a tough couple of days to say the least for a lot of folks. Yeah. Great, thank you. Jamie? Yeah, if I could just follow up on that a little bit more specifically. Um, I, I know, Matt, that both you and Jay are, 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 are responsive to the issue and looking at solutions and all that kind of stuff. What I would suggest, and maybe it requires um, a, a little bit of budget, either in the part-time payroll or overtime payroll line item, maybe for this coming calendar year, um, look at a, a almost piloting, you know, test and learn kind of approach on, I think what Penny's respond, referring to is, um, usually pretty isolated and um, individualized occurrences, but when they happen, the perception then throughout town is that the whole operation is inefficient, and that's not reflective of the reality. I mean, most days when you go there, and even most Saturdays when you go there, um, it's pretty streamlined. It, you get in and out pretty quickly, but that one or two mega, you know, backups, like we saw around Christmas time, and then all of a sudden people's impression of the whole place doesn't match what the typical reality is. So that's number one. So as a result of that, what I was going to suggest is that maybe there be some budget and hours uh, dedicated towards some very targeted um, openings uh, or extended hours on days when we'd normally be closed, but you can, you, you can look at the calendar and say, hey, if it's the first day after a holiday, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be overloaded. So maybe there's some extra hours or an additional day that gets built in just in that specific thing, not expanding the regular you know, operating hours, not going back to a Tuesday or a Thursday, um, you know, like we've peeled away from in the past decade or so, but just looking at that calendar and saying, okay, we know that this is gonna be a bottleneck day because it's high volume after a holiday or something like that. And then just having a special opening for that or extended hours just for that. And again, that, that may require some extra hours on the part of the staff, so. I think that's a great idea. And, you know, that was kind of the thought process of, of providing an extended day or two around the holidays. And uh, my, my learning experience last year was it actually began before the holidays and I, I was not expecting that. So that was, uh, that caught me off guard a little bit. So it was something I, I was not expecting and, and learned quite a bit from. So I think even before the holidays might, might make sense too, uh, as we're approaching those days. So we can certainly do that. Uh, I believe there is money in overtime that could probably handle that. I know the former director had a little bit of a contingency in there for, for extra, extra services at times. Thank you. Other, um, other questions on, on the uh, recycling and MSW? Hearing none, um, let's let's go on. We can come back if we need to, but let's go on to parks and grounds on 127. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so 330 parks and grounds is the uh, newly 
formed uh, consolidated budget, which the council approved uh, just a few weeks ago, I believe. And this is a consolidation of uh, the former 640, 641, and 645, and 660, which was parks, school grounds, Fort Williams Park, and street trees. Uh, so it was those four department codes merged into what you are looking at now, which is the 330 parks and grounds accounts. The narratives have pretty much been consolidated from those uh, particular accounts. So I've tried to carry uh, the previous information from those 600s um, to this account. Uh, generally speaking, again, not much change in operations, kind of keeping things status quo and continuing our operations, uh, both in public works and recycling and also on parks, facilities and grounds. Uh, this covers all of the exterior grounds on all, all of the town owned properties in essence. That's what this boils down to. Uh, that includes uh, the, the grounds at Fort Williams, Plaisted Park, Gullcrest, uh, school campus, uh, fire, police, town hall, Lions Field, and any others that I'm not thinking of at the moment. <laughs> uh, so that takes care of all the mowing. Uh, it takes care of the athletic fields, the line striping for athletics, um, turf management. That's a big part of it. Uh, some of the contractual services are the porta potties at Fort Williams. Uh, most of that is in the professional services account, uh, which is the 2010 account under 330. Uh, so again, no monumental changes. Uh, the percentages, I'm seeing some high percentage changes from year over year, and I think that has more to do with uh, how the accounts were broken apart. We did move some funds uh, to, to Kathy's budgets in community services. And I believe some may have gone to facilities uh, with regards to some of the utilities. Uh, so I think that's uh, a reason why you see some of the high percentage changes on the uh, far right column. Overall, it's a, uh, a minus 3%. And again, that's, that's mostly due to the movement of, of funds to community services and breaking that out from the previous budgets. So I'll stop there and let you jump in if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a question uh, about heat, which is on page 133. Um, it says it's heat just for the maintenance building at Fort Williams. And it's almost as much as heating the entire um, town center station fire department. So I was just wondering if that is accurate. Is that really just for one building? Do you know? I would have to ask Perry if he could uh, help me out okay. on that one. I believe actually Fort Williams heat is only about 4,500. So I'd have to okay. re research what the remaining uh, is applicable towards. Yeah, I, I really was just curious because I was wondering if it just if there was something we could do to increase if it was really just one building if there was some sort of, you know, something we could do to make it more efficient but sounds like maybe there's other things hidden in there that we're not seeing. I believe so and Perry I think you can confirm that we did replace um, the heating system in the uh, garage for parks at Fort Williams uh, before I got here is that correct. Yes, that is correct. And I, I do believe this is actually a couple buildings. I I can find out more about it. Yeah, my guess is that, that this would also include the officer's row buildings as well in there. Oh, maybe. Okay. Yeah, that would make sense. Thank you. Yeah, it would make, yeah that's, that's Absolutely. Three, different, <laughs> three different sets of boilers there. Otherwise, we'd be shutting some doors at the uh, parks maintenance building pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions on this before we move on to Perry? Great, and Jay, you'll, you'll be sticking around to join us for the CIP discussion in a little bit? Okay, absolutely. 
All right, Perry, um, I believe you are up next. Um, and if you wouldn't mind giving us a page number to start, that would be fantastic. Uh, we're going to start with 600 facilities management, and that is on page 153. All right, take it away. All right, the, the facilities management is kind of a, a general catch-all for, uh, for our department and, and the general maintenance around the buildings. Uh, the two outstanding numbers this year that are a little different is the uh, consolidated building maintenance. Um, that is up 11%. It's solely due to a historical trend that we're seeing with the town buildings. And also just uh, COVID has changed things financially. Uh, cost of contractors, cost of material, everything just seems to be up. So we, we put a little extra in there this year. I don't know that it will be a trending thing ongoing, but a, a little bit of an extra pad just to cover us to get through the remainder of the pandemic and the costs associated. Um, school provided services. I just wanted to kind of explain that a little bit. It, there's a number that's not reflected in any of these pages and I, I'll just give it to you and you can write it down and remember it. The, the total that the school uh, bills, for lack of a better word, bills the town is $271,903. So, so what you'll see is a portion come out in, in, in this 600 category and then it'll be divided out in other categories accordingly due to this particular category covers the maintenance crew and, and myself. So this would be, I believe it's 35% of my pay and 25% of the maintenance crew pay. And that's where this number comes from. And that, that's pretty much a 24 hour a day, seven days a week, seven days a week, 365 days a year coverage. Uh, the remainder in the other categories, categories that we move on to will be based solely on the custodial services and their hourly figures of what they spend in each building. And I'll go through each one of those as we go to, to that particular building. But uh, that is all I have for the general facility maintenance. Everything else was pretty much stayed flat. Are there any questions with that one? I, I don't have a question um, that I, I found that explanation um, for what's covered under the twenty nine ninety nine very helpful, Perry. And I wonder if for for future year budgets, if we could, you know, not necessarily that top line number, but just the explanation you gave for how those those costs are allocated, include that in the in the description. Um, some one sixty four of this year's budget that would be very helpful. Yes, absolutely. Um, other questions, any questions for Perry on this account? I'm, so, I'm sorry, Jeremy. I've been like switching everything. Can you tell me what account we're on? I just got out of my truck into my office and got everything hooked up. So. Oh, we, we saw you. You looked like you were in a Matt Damon movie being chased around. Oh, was, my oh. God. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we are we are uh, just starting with Perry's budgets, Penny. Uh, we're on page one fifty three, um, and we're just going okay. through the um, initial, you know, the six hundreds. Um, so just getting started with Perry's Perry's portion. Of the budget. No worries at all. Okay, can I ask a general question then? I, I don't know. If, I don't know if it fits here because my brain hasn't wrapped around everything yet. But this is to to Perry and. And I, I have to I have to tell you that I I look at COVID as such a learning opportunity, and um and and everybody thinks of it as something that uh, we we're gonna move past. But what I want to know is what are our learnings that we're gonna carry forward from that? Because we talk about building, we talk about ventilation, we talk about all of these things that are needed, and all COVID did was highlight those. So. How do those things get integrated into plans moving forward? And, and how do we, um, uh, as we look at this overall uh, uh, budget across facilities, how do we look at each one of the actions that need to be taken, whether it's around roof or other parts of in infrastructure, as a way to start mig migrating our building toward 
on either more energy efficiency um, uh, and or plant efficiency or people efficiency, because I see what we have learned is something that we carry forward. And I would love to see it in our in our budgets and plans. OK, yeah, I mean, basically, the things that have been learned is I, I, I believe that the disinfecting part of the, the pandemic uh, will be a permanent uh, exactly. technique exactly. Uh, ongoing and the same with with hand sanitizing stations they back when we had the swine flu and the bird flu they kind of came and went quickly uh, but i don't think those were quite acknowledged like this one was so i believe i believe you'll be seeing uh hand sanitizers around as a permanent installation in our buildings uh ventilation we do most most of the town buildings are doing pretty well on the ventilation um town hall is us uh, is up in age and does have some uh, you know it's that's something that we would need to tackle at town hall as it currently has no ventilation at all in that building it's just not designed for it so it's definitely an opportunity that something could be roughed in i'll call it uh it would take alterations to the building uh basically uh maybe a ventilation system that would be installed in the basement that would blow up into the first floor and they ventilation system in the attic area that would blow down into the second floor and go in that route. So I believe the possibility of doing it is is there. Um, that would be something that I would say we would look look into moving into the future. Um, energy efficiency, I, I, you know, by part of the services that I provide to the town, I'm also the uh, liaison to the energy committee and uh, they are an extremely motivated group and I, I'm, uh, I'm learning a lot from them. Um, we, we, ha we have a high focus on, on moving forward with things uh, like solar, um, getting contracted right where what we don't save in, in the town's own personal solar, they will subscribe to another service where there might be another solar farm somewhere in the state and we will reap those benefits as well um, in, in conjunction with our own solar uh, facility. Um, so we, yeah, we're constantly looking at LED lighting and, and, and upgrades like that to just improve the overall efficiency of the town. I, there was a lot of questions there. Did I get all of them for you? I, I think really it, it was a lot of questions, but it's about a mindset. Yep. And that's, that's it's like um, we have an opportunity to always think outside the box. Yes. versus just fix the problem. And and I will say one more thing, and this is just Penny's editorial comment. Solar is not the only solution to energy efficiency. There is a lot of different solutions that's out there. And I think we have the, uh, the ability to be able to look at what are all of the solution sets that will position us for uh, well into the middle of the 21st century. I agree. I think I, I think some of those questions um, kind of bridge us nicely into the next couple few um, department items where, where we have budgets for individual buildings. If you want to maybe walk us through uh, six tens through maybe around like six twenty one, and then we can uh, kind of pause there and see if there's additional questions on some of the other ones. Sure. You you want me to just move right through them all and then come back? Okay. Uh, 610 is the building, the town hall building, uh, basically water, power, sewer, um, I have all stayed the same. School provided services, this this building has, or this account has never had this line in it. In it. This is a new uh, line for this year. And the school provided services are based on a custodian in that building uh, four and a half hours every day doing the cleaning work. Um, on all of these, I just went with a basic wage of about $20 per hour for the cleaning services. Uh, heat is up $1,000 and that is solely just based on the history of usage at Town Hall. 
615 on page 155 of the library building. Uh, again, we have the school provided services uh, would be the custodian. That line has been adjusted accordingly uh, to, to a, a more accurate. The original number was set by the previous business manager in, in the school department and uh, I'm not quite sure where they got their numbers from, but so I, I just wanted to kind of, you know, John, John's been working with me to try to, to get these numbers a little more accurate per building. So we kind of get an idea of what the, the overhead in each building actually is. So th this is a more of a correct figure of a custodian cleaning the library six hours a day. And then the, the heat, I'm constantly monitoring there. Um, and we seem to be doing good in heat in the library each year after year. So. This year we took a thousand dollars off of it. 620, the town center fire station. Water and sewer is up. That's just based on usage, uh, $1,100. Contracted services, that's, that's a service that they have for their air hoses that connect to the truck. Um, it's a special service that uh, the company is the only one that can provide that type of service to them. And the uh, heat is also up. I believe basically all of these items, the water and sewer and heat is solely based on the usage of the building. Uh, there's an increased usage there. So everything's it's there. because of the new billets there, right? What's that? Well, I mean, I assume it has to do with the new, the new billets, the new, the new- uh, uh, Sleeping right, sleeping quarters. Sleeping quarters, quarters yeah. Department. yeah. 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 And um, and also, I just wanted to note it's it's not reflected in here, but kind of a little inside quirk, I'll call it. Uh, town center fire station and the police station share, share the same electrical meter, so you won't see an electrical cost for the fire department. It's actually covered under the police department. Uh, community center 621 on page 157. Uh, I'm not sure, back when I came here in July of 2017, I wasn't sure why there was $1,200 for part-time payroll or a $92 for social security. So after about four years of being here, I just decided to take those out. I've never seen them used or, or anything. So I believe those can go away. <laughs> Uh, maintenance, maintenance is up. The, um, that's the, just the general need at the community center. Uh, we are approaching a time now where that's starting to, uh, we're going to need some paint there, uh, coming up very shortly. I may even start on that, uh, this spring uh, and just start touching up areas that are in a little bit of a, a rougher looking shape. School provided services, uh, that is the custodial services based on five and a half hours a day. And the outlay, um, again, that, that's another line that was in there prior to my arrival. I, I believe it was set by the former uh, facilities director. And um, we, I've never had to use it. I'm not quite sure why it was there. When we have a special needs project or a capital improvements project, I talk with Matt about that and we, uh, Hammer those projects out in a CIP form. If you don't mind, Perry, I think I'll pause you there and see if there's any questions up to that point. Penny? I have a question. Um, it's a relative to the uh, community services because you have highlighted the increases in building maintenance. Have you developed a comprehensive plan to what maintenance we may be looking at over the next three to five years? It is an older building that uh, was refurbed a while back. Um, is there a, a plan in place so that we can see what's on the horizon? Yeah, we, we do have a, um, a, Matt has copies of the larger scale projects for the town buildings that we have coming up. I believe it's a five-year outlook. So it can kind of run uh, side by side with what's going on large scale at the, at the uh, schools as well. So we're not kind of crossing paths or doing expenses on in one year. Um, we do have some surprises. This year we had two heat pumps actually fail at community services. And uh, you know, that, that was a little bit of a unforeseen, but 
uh, they came to the end of their lifespan early. Um, those will be addressed this summer. Perry, is there, uh, I'm just curious what the rule of, if we have a rule of thumb or, and maybe this is a question for Matt for sort of when, um, you know, build, regular building maintenance costs like the ones that you have in here under the community service building cross over into the capital side of the budget? Generally, when you're looking at uh, large, larger ticket items, you know, like the, like for instance, this year, the heat pumps are in there as a, as a capital expenditure. Uh, but as far as your regular routine maintenance, uh, we try to have that in your, you know, for your, your flooring or different replacements, things along those lines. That's like a regular operational operational expense there versus, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's just something that you want to always have money available for, uh, for, for the, you know, to, to work within that lifestyle or that life, life cycle, sorry. And then I guess, uh, so I guess to build on that, I, you know, I, I note that we don't have any uh, like a line item budgeted um, for, you know, the first three or four individual buildings that we we put in there um, in terms of that maintenance. Um, and I'm, so I guess I'm wondering if, you know, does it make more sense to to budget or look at those maintenance items from the, you know, sort of from the perspective overall of the facilities management, sort of the 600s and and put a line item in there that can be distributed across those buildings as those maintenance needs arise? Or should we be, yeah, I guess, I don't know if this is what Penny was getting at too, you know, developing more detailed building by building plans that fall into these other accounts. It, it's something to consider. I know looking at, at the earlier uh, in the 600 side of it uh, with some of the uh, consolidated building maintenance, some of that funding would come, come from there. Uh, when you do need to have repairs done, that may uh, that's almost uh, similar to in the technology side, where we do fund for for anticipated failures of uh, of computer systems, for instance, or like a, lap, a laptop or a tabletop or a desktop might might die out. In this case, uh, part of it would be that consolidated building. But then, if we did know, for instance, that uh, like roofing is an is an area that we want to start, you know, we always have. For this building in particular, we always are putting new shingles on this building just uh, due to the way that the, the wind hits it for some reason. Uh, but that's that's a constant item that we have. But then there are also buildings down at the port that we uh, look at roofing down there. So that's a consistent line that we have. Uh, so when it's specific to a building that we know that the maintenance is going to have to take place there, we would probably put that in the school provide. Uh, sorry, the uh, under the under that specific buildings cost center, and then the other part would be for the general maintenance of all of all town buildings. But it is something that we do want to, you know, you do want to have a five year plan consistently with our buildings for that, especially. Um, just I mean, in this building, for instance, uh, you know, we we've got to look at heating system at some point as well. We this we're particularly challenged. Uh, at times, with, especially with the first floor, as John as John would attest to, uh, so it has it has its challenges as an older building. So we do find things that that do arise uh, spontaneously here on occasion. But Matt, isn't that a building where we would uh, kind of step back and say, yeah, as we're looking at heating systems? Because if we go to our council goal around incorporating new technologies as like we address infrastructure issues, um, if you take, uh, and I'll take community services building as an example, and um, as you could hear before, I'm not a solar zealot, but, um, but there is an upper, that's a roof span that could uh, uh, generate uh, electricity to offset uh, heat pumps in that building. Uh, those are the types of things that yeah. As we look at these buildings, I'd love to see us uh, uh, looking at those types of solutions. So, yeah, anyway. uh, very well noted, uh, Councilor Jordan, as, as well. And I, 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 with Perry, you know, being here, that could be something we definitely would want to task the Energy Committee with, or at least have staff thinking of, because. Yeah, I mean, with us, this building, for instance, it's a bear to heat and cool. In the summertime, and so you know, we then the, when we did the first floor uh, tax collection area over uh, two years ago, uh, you know, heat pumps were installed down there, and I think that's that's worked uh, better for them, specific to the cooling side of it. 
but yeah, we do find areas that we can find greater efficiency or more, you know, yeah, in line with the council goals. We'll, we'll definitely try to pursue that as a as an objective. But I love the idea about putting panels on the communities and a roof. You know, especially if we were thinking about replacing the roof at some time, you'd want to line that up because it's about 18 years since the roof was probably put on there now. Well, if it's 18 years, it's time for a replacement. It's Anyways, it would be at my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Other questions for Perry before we move on to the last three, looks like last three accounts in here? Okay, take, go on to the pool building, Perry. Okay, yeah, the, uh, I just wanted to also add um, as something I forgot to mention the penny earlier too, is that the energy committee is also working on having uh, scheduling tests done on the town buildings at some point to do a full blown energy audit. Uh, I recently did an energy audit walkthrough um, on the police station, fire station and public works for LED lighting upgrades. And I'll be receiving that information shortly that could be passed along that would show, you know, what the, what the town would get in a return on that investment if we were to switch those buildings. Those three buildings were picked in particular because of the length of time the lighting is on in those buildings. Uh, but we were talking about full blown blower tests on the doorways to actually see the efficiency of the building and the insulation and things like that. So there is more of that to come and there, there is a plan um, uh, by the energy committee and myself to follow through with more, infor more information on that to come. Um, 622 Richard's pool building. Uh, the only thing we have there is the school provided services that have changed and uh, that is, that number is based on, is now based on for this upcoming year is based on a five hour, five hours of cleaning service in that building, uh, the custodial service. Everything else has remained the same in that building. 6.30, the police station. Uh, let's see here. It looks like the only, con the only ch change we have here is the, again, the school provided services. That building is marked for three and a half hours of cleaning service um, on a daily basis. And 631 Cape Cottage Fire Station, there is no changes there. Um, Cape Cottage is a side of it needing a little bit of paint and a freshen it up to uh, carry us a few more years. Uh, Cape Cottage is just down there chugging along. And that is all I have. Thank you, Perry. Sorry if I uh, interrupted your flow there, stop and asking you to stop in the middle of the accounts like that. Oh, that's um, fine. <laughs> any, any questions, um, general questions or comments for Perry on any of the budget line items that he has presented so far? I also did want to note that, you know, our, our goal is to, um, what I want to do in this upcoming year is try to back on, back on uh, page 153, that consolidated building maintenance line, line number 2035. I would, I would like to get a more accurate reading uh, for council to be able to review each building individually, how the how the community services has its own maintenance line, and the pool has its own maintenance line. I, I want to start being able to chisel chisel away at this consolidated line a little bit, and so you can get a more accurate view of cost per building, and 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 you it'll give you more a better idea of wow this building is leading needing a lot of work maybe we need to address that or this one's not too bad we can throttle back on that one and put our money somewhere else it, it, it's just a better way of doing it I, I appreciate that and I appreciate the way that the the costs are now broken out across buildings for the custodial services and the other cost centers it's much easier to follow where the 
the budgeted costs are being expended. Um, then, so yeah, I, I can see, I can see some some great improvements from you, and it looks like uh, John Q's hand in in helping pull these uh, budgets in, into better shape. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, and I assume you're going to be sticking around to join us for the CIP discussion as well. Yep, I'll be okay. here. Great. Kathy, would you like to uh, bring us into the world of community services? I would love to. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. I know it's been a challenging year for you, and it's a challenging year here at Community Services as well. But um, we're trying to look at it as opportunities and opportunities for us to deliver to the community as best we can. And we are a selective revenue. Um, people participate in our programs um, if they have the means and the time to do so. So given all of that took place back in March when we had to close down and then we had to start um, canceling our classes, reimbursing our participants, and my staff stepped to the plate unbelievably and worked throughout that whole time frame, making sure that all our instructors were taken care of, all of our participants were taken care of, and in May, we came back to work and we started to, in the office, we provided the assistance on the helpline to the community and started planning for summer. Our greeters at the fort came back, our rangers came back, the park opened to pedestrians and bicyclists and things just started to pick up again for us. And we actually were the first pool in Southern Maine to open when we started back in June. And we did so the best that we could. We implemented a sign up genius program that Matt suggested we utilize some town, I think it was Cumberland was using or Gray was using for appointments. And, you know, it was a learning curve for us. Um, but Jane took it upon herself to learn it. And that goes out every Wednesday morning at 630 and the pool participants in Cape Elizabeth are waiting for it. And we've been open since then with no closure of the pool, no closure of the fitness center. And we do the same thing there with limited use, obviously, for that, that area because of the size. And Kelly Finney, I can't say enough about her. Um, she got our summer camp up and running outside. And, you know, she was just ingenious when it came to what we could do there. She, you know, we had tents outside. We had, um, we used hula hoops to separate all the kids. We canceled all our field trips because we couldn't travel on buses, but we were able to get it up and running and served over a hundred students. Um, from Cape Elizabeth in all the different facilities that we could utilize outside. And everybody helped out when all of that was concerned. So as the year progressed, then we got into, um, we took advantage of the closure too for the pool. So we knew that um, when we weren't gonna open, we normally close the pool for two and a half weeks in August and we didn't want to reopen and then have to close it again. So in April, we took advantage of that time and, cl and cleaned the pool and did all of the work and maintenance that has to take place down there. So our revenue has been hit drastically, um, but we're getting back on track. Our programming is there. We brought the community back with our hybrid learning. Um, when we found out that the school wasn't going to go back full time, we offer that. We have 20 to 25 students a day here. Um, doing their schoolwork in our community center. And we also have the preschool and our before and after care program that's running. Those were all um, had to be limited in numbers too as we started up, but um, I'm happy to say that for next year, we already have 30 preschoolers committed, which will make us have um, justify a third classroom for the preschoolers. We have 40 aftercare kids committed um, on a daily basis and that program will run strong again. Um, there's monies on accounts that people, when they were withdrawing from us and we had to start reimbursing, the um, ActiveNet software program that we utilize reimburses us for credit card transactions over a period of time. So that every two weeks we get money back from them for what we utilized it. At one point in the spring, we, had, we were trying to reimburse people to get the clean the books up and we reached our max. They had already reimbursed us for some of that money. So we had to put the monies on account here at community services for those consumers to then utilize. And when that happens, that revenue doesn't come back in as new revenue. So just some little things that I think will clean up as we finish out this fiscal year and starting next year, 
we'll have the clean books that we're, we were looking for. Um, also, just as an aside, I just renegotiated um, our software program fees that we were being charged. Um, we were being charged 3% 3, 3 per transaction and I negotiated it down to 2% and then there's a credit card processing fee that was at 3.599 and we and I negotiated that down to 3.5 and there was always a fixed fee charge too and we've removed that completely. So I think we'll see some, some good uh, payback from that change as well. Um, planning for the revenue what I did was I kind of looked back to fiscal year into 2019. We were ahead um, record breaking year at that point. And I looked at where we were in February of that year, where we were in February of, two, of 20. And that was, we were doing phenomenal at that point as well. Then the pandemic hit, everything kind of fell by the wayside. Our numbers dropped. And I think with the vaccine and with changes, um, some people will get back. Some people have formed their own new way of either caring for their children or exercising or whatnot. So we kind of, I did a, a general look at that, kind of looked at what the programming was that we were offering and that's where the revenue numbers have come from that we have projected. The expenses will go with the revenue. Um, if the revenue doesn't come up, the expenses won't go up. So it's, they're, they're interrelated that way. That is on the community services side. I don't know if you have any questions specifically. If you look at um, the breakdown of each of the departments, you'll see that the um, at the pool, we lost one of our full-time employees. So there was a reduction in the full-time salary, but an increase in the part-time salary. We're looking to bring on a, a weekend supervisor that would be a part-time employee. In the Cape Care program, they're considered part-time employees because they're school year employees and there's an increase in the salary there. That's for the third classroom that we hope to open and the supplies will go um, correlate with that with opening a new classroom and having to get all the supplies up and running for that area as well. I didn't know if you had any questions specifically about the community services. Go for it, Jamie. Kathy, um, this is tremendous. Thank you for your work. And um, also, uh, you know, kudos to everybody in the department for all the, all the work they're doing. I have just a very general question. How often do you guys look at um, program pricing sort of relative to either competitive community offerings or even private offerings? We look at the program pricing, the um, each department, so to speak, youth, uh, adult, or senior, each time we do a new brochure, they take a look at what we're charging, what the community could afford, if there's a competitor that's charging much different. Um, if we bring on a new instructor, we talk about that. So it, it's looked at at least three times a year with these different programs that continue. And then as okay. we bring new programs on, they're looked at at that time. Great. That's good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you to you and your team. You did an exceptional job this last year with COVID, with all the closings. Uh, everybody just stepped up to the plate. They were creative. Didn't you even set up a call center? Um, we did. Yeah. Yes. Um, people could call in and if they had questions about COVID, all these things. Um, I'm so impressed with um, the creativity and your um, willingness to just take this all on. Um, we even had summer camp last year. So thank you so much. I'm, um, I'm just surprised that there's so many um, cuts. I would have thought that you might need extra money, especially, again, I'm gonna mention this to you, um, no COVID supplies. Um, do you, don't you think you may need a line item for that this next year, especially with all the kids coming back? Um, we didn't utilize all that we, you know, there wasn't, all we had were the thermometers that we purchased throughout the year and we did take everybody's uh, temperature. Um, there, that we've some, we did put that into COVID supplies in the past. Um, I didn't know if the COVID supplies would continue as we move forward, if that was a continuing line item in the budget. 
Um, a lot of what we purchased, we got reimbursed for um, through the CARES Act, through the uh, Marcy helped out with that. And we got um, some of the salaries that we paid to our Cape Care staff and some of the supplies that we had to purchase as a result of that. So um, hand sanitizer, we utilized and we got reimbursed. That was coded to COVID as we went forward. I, I don't know how much more of that we'll be utilizing, um, but there should probably be you know, it's probably in my era, put it under just general supplies when it could go under COVID supplies. Well, Matt, um, will they be, I guess we receive it all, all the money as a municipality from the, um, the Rescue Act, but will some of it um, specifically go to community services for some of the programs with children? I, I think a good portion of the uh, aid that or some of the CARES Act that's supposed to be coming forward, I think will help offset the uh, revenue that we did not actualize in the current uh, fiscal year. Uh, so that, that was a pretty big, uh, pretty big change as Kathy was talking about uh, from where we would anticipate to be normally. Uh, so that would help offset some of those revenues. But uh, as she, she also pointed out, you know, the, on the in CARES Act too, uh, there was that funding that came forward to help offset uh, expenses that we did have already or were currently occurring. So that's that's been applied as it becomes available. And if there are other avenues that we can, you know, as we find more details, if there's additional resources we can tap, we will jump on that with both feet uh, for sure as well. Okay. And Marcy is doing the second half of that. So I'm putting together the salary reimbursement that we'll, we could get and supplies that we've purchased. So I think we received 23,000 in the last one. So I'll see what that is. And one of the benefits of the, care, of the, of, uh, the CARES Act and the deployment of the vaccine is that uh, with community services being a child care operator, uh, staff is also eligible to become vaccinated uh, earlier than they would have under the other. So that's been a positive, uh, positive result as well. Uh, so that's, that's good for staff. And the, the other exciting thing, yeah, I love the fact that we have the third classroom going forward and plan because uh, you know, as you probably have seen in the paper, child care and the ability for that type of uh, uh, educational atmosphere is uh, in short supply at the present time. And uh, they're definitely meeting a demand. And out of 15 people in my um, full-time employees who could be vaccinated, 12 are, have received, we've all received our first shot. One is scheduled next week and two have opted out. So the majority of the staff is, is on the way to being completely vaccinated, which I think brings comfort to the people that are gonna come here with their children as well, as the, uh, and, and with the seniors that we service. Great, thank you. Other questions for Kathy on sort of the general community services line item budgets? Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could jump in for just a second too, I, I, I just wanna echo, and I've said this a million times probably that, uh, uh, the resources of community services and under Kathy's leadership have just been outstanding and she has phenomenal staff. Uh, couldn't be more proud of them as well. Uh, they were they were hitting home runs all last summer. And uh, you know, one of the coolest things was getting the thank you notes that, you know, I reached out to all the parents from the from the program at the end of the end of last year's uh, summer camp, just thanking them for trusting our staff. And uh, the response back was overwhelmingly thank thanking uh, Kathy and her staff for for making that available because so many towns just shut down. They just said, nope, we're not gonna do it. It's too much to do. And they stepped up and, and made that happen and uh, really excited for the next coming year. But a lot of that comes down to Kathy's leadership. She's done a phenomenal job over there. She was my first hire as a department head. So uh, pretty proud of that fact. And uh, uh, so really happy to ha have, have her and the work she's done. and. Uh, if you get a chance to go to GP Cog's annual meeting this this spring, uh, I have put. Uh, um, they're going to be doing some stories that came out of the pandemic, and uh, I put Tom Bell from GP Cog in contact, or should be in contact with Kathy, to reach out to Kelly Finney, who uh, came up with so many creative ideas to make camp happen last year, as well as Officer Darren Estes with his program for working to outreach to seniors as well. So. I thought those are two of the hero stories that we had in the, in the past year. So uh, anticipate seeing that at some point in the future too when, when those stories come forward. I could have given them a lot more, but I didn't want to just have it be a Cape spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Thanks, Matt. Um, Thank yeah. Um, uh, Kathy, I think we also have the Fort Williams CIP budget um, we do. as well, and then you get to log off, I think. <laughs> yeah. well, I have one item on the community services one, the, the van, but that's okay. um, on hold right now. So that's the only thing that's in my CIP budget was the, okay. it's, and it's actually um, uh, another there. vehicle for Fort Williams Park. <laughs> so. Um, but so the next on my agenda that we have on the agenda though is the the um, fund sixty five the Fort Worth yes. Park CIP um, yep. which is on two eighteen so if you want to walk us through that that would be great yep um, so this is where um, the revenue coming into the fort through these different um, sub ledgers and then the projects that Fort Williams Park Committee then takes on to try and, and maintain the, the park from a customer service perspective. And that's where the Fort Williams Park Committee and myself come into play with, with this. Um, again, the fort was impacted greatly by the pandemic. They, we, you know, we closed it for a very long period of time and then it started opening and, you know, we didn't have the rentals taking place. We didn't have the site fees, you know, where photographers and anybody were coming into the fort. We didn't have, the beach to beacon and that type of thing. So going forward for this budget year, the same thing is true. Beach to beacon at this point, um, they are going to make a decision by March 31st is my understanding um, in conversations with David Backer. So we removed, that's the biggest rental for the site fees that we bring in the biggest revenue. We've removed that. Um, the ceremony fees are running very well. They're very consistent. Those are weddings at the park and they're consistent, you know, around 40 of those a year and we're right ahead of target. And that's where we, you know, we kind of stay with. There's only so many weekends, I guess, in the summer that people are willing to get married at the fort. Um, the bus and trolley revenue will be down significantly. Um, again, the cruise ships impact that. We'll have some people that will be coming to the fort from smaller bus tours. Um, but certainly nothing like what we've had um, in the past. And the picnic, you know, the rentals of the different facilities at Fort Williams are impacted. Um, and one thing that we'll, you know, want to discuss and you'll want to discuss, and I'll have to talk to the Fort Williams Park Committee, is that we had limited or restricted the rentals to 50 people at Fort Williams Park. And we maintain that through even to this day. And I don't know if that's something that we're going to have to, you know, or that we can go look at from increasing that number or not, but that could be impacting some of the rentals when we have bigger groups that want to come and we're limiting to the 50 people. So just a thought, um, and I'm not sure what that process is, if that's something that the Fort Williams Park Committee brings to you as a recommendation to then open it, or if it's just a decision that you make. Um, concessions, we're doing pretty well. We've got three of them rented. Um, three came back, the, the three that we've had for a significant period of time, bite into Maine, Gorgeous Gelato, and Cousins. So they are all scheduled to be back. We still do have the Ship Cove parking um, area available, should that come into play. Um, but that is where that one is. The um, donation boxes were down significantly, um, and we expected that with Pain Display. Pain Display is doing well. Um, it's opening, we're having the meters actually open this year as of April 1st. They should be delivered by the end of this month and installed. And we'll start with um, the pay and display process. The actual projects that the Fort Williams Park Committee is looking at. Um, and I do want to say that Fort Williams, you know, our role in Fort Williams is the community side of it, community services, the customer service aspect of it. And we have some fantastic employees down there, mainly led by Chris Cutter. And then the greeters and the rangers have done a phenomenal job as well. We had a couple of, uh, well, one ranger that retired, one you had approved an additional ranger for us. And so we had, we just finished the um, application and it's out there and we'll be hiring a new ranger. Um, at least one, and our three greeters are back this year. So we're, we're excited for that too. Um, do you wanna just go right into the projects, Jeremy? So 
there's always the miscellaneous projects um, and that's where we have the $20,000 for miscellaneous projects. And one of the projects that potentially will be coming into that miscellaneous project is updating um, the tennis courts that are the two tennis courts at the lower part of the of Fort Williams Park. There's a lot of uh, wear and tear on those, there's cracks and we have to get that um, taken care of. That came forth in our user group meetings. And so we need to address that. Um, I just wanna backtrack a little bit as you're well aware, we've been working on the master plan for Fort Williams Park, and it's been extremely busy, a lot of work going into it, but I think you'll be impressed with all of the work that's gonna come out of it as well. And we did all the user group meetings. We sought a lot of public input through the user groups, through the customer service, uh, excuse me, the questionnaire. Um, all of our meetings have been posted and people can certainly come and listen to the discussions the visits to the park that um, all of the vendor, you know, the different aspects of the vendor have done. And we got an update from them in February on all of these findings. And then we developed the goals that we want to achieve with the master plan. And now we've just started receiving the recommendations. And that was, Jeremy was a participant in that as well. It was a three hour meeting last night. It was a three hour meeting March 4th. And we have another one on March 31st. So we're trying to pull together all of the recommendations to fit under the goals and what ones we want to you know, address in the next 10 years. Um, and then we'll do a public forum and obviously involve town council at that point. But it's going very, very well, but it's um, could impact changing some of these um, projects that we've put forth here. Um, so the tennis courts would fall under the, that miscellaneous projects. Um, there's fencing in the fort that's down at the south end of Cliff Walk. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the lighthouse way down to the right, more near the uh, dog walking area that needs upgrade, you know, to finalize and finish the uh, fencing to be all like the other side of the Cliff Walk. And that's where this, um, it's broken into a couple different sections to make up this $43,000. So we have the south end fencing that we wanna just finalize. Um, the berm, um, that's the old firing range at the fort at that end of, right by that fencing as well. And it's a dirt pile basically, but there it was a shooting range and the, um, the soil is contaminated. We've had GP Cog look at it. Um, this money, it's not enough to remove the berm by any stretch of the imagination. I think now it's a matter of what can we do there to just improve the look of that area and make it more visibly pleasing for the for people down at the fort. The invasive plant management, we've been doing a lot of that over the years and that's continuing. And um, Andrea Southworth at Friends of Fort Williams has done a phenomenal job there. And she has been working with vegetative control services and they come in, they kind of walk around the park, they determine what they're gonna take out from um, the invasive species. And she has come up with a three to five year plan on how they wanna do that. And people, um, you may have heard, we've heard that, you know, some people are um, a little bit taken aback by some of the clearing that we've done down there. It's selective clearing and Public Works has been involved in it. It's to take out the invasive species and have the nat uh, natural habitat come back. So. That is all by design. It's certainly not clear cutting as some people may refer to it as. So we've, you know, we've handled those and we're gonna to continue to put monies into that budget so that we can work on that throughout the time. Um, park signage improvements, we need to continue. We have seen the new signs down there um, and we need to continue with the signs and make sure people know where they're going and, but have some more um, interactive interpretive signs so that people know the history of the fort in certain areas and that may be helpful for people. This is the one that um, the picnic shelter parking lot, paving and drainage, we had that on the agenda last year and we removed it to consider again in future years, which now we're bringing it forth to you again. Um, there does need to be improvements in that picnic shelter parking lot. The master plan has some different ideas for that parking lot. so. While we're asking for the monies, when the master plan is finalized through this late uh, summer, probably early fall, we'll know what of these projects that we're gonna have to do now, or if it's something that we wanna just think about for the future. Um, 
this is where if you um, the electric charge stations would be in the picnic shelter parking lot. We brought those to the committee and we talked about some different areas within the park for those to be considered. And, and they felt that in the picnic shelter parking lot by the Porta Johnton, you know, not by the Porta Johnton, but by the shed back there at that <laughs> edge of the parking lot would be the better area, but the parking lot needs to be paved and to accommodate some of that. So that's one of the projects that we want to do. And then lastly, um, last year we put in or asked, requested $50,000 to do the concrete stone wall at the end of the central parking lot that was starting to crumble in some areas. Um, when Jay and myself and Jim Kearney uh, uh, looked at that and had um, a vendor come in and look at it, it's not as immediate need and some of the other areas of the park, there's the stone wall that's on the other side of Battery Blair that needs some work. There's a stone wall that's up near where Beach to Beacon comes in, where the dog walking area is that needs work. And there's some stone work that needs to be done in the picnic shelter, the patio area that looks out at the water needs some, there's some safety concerns there and down at uh, the gazebo. Uh, so there's that we want to reallocate that money that you allowed to us or gave to us last year of $50,000. We want to carry it over to this fiscal year, but reallocate it to the stone walls. So that is where Fort William stands. Thank you, Kathy. Um, mm -hmm. Any questions from the council? Valerie? Kathy, um, thank you. You touched on my question, which was about the picnic shelter parking lot. We have the new master plan being developed, and from what I'm hearing at some of the um, some of the meetings, is they're even talking about different types of signage. Um, they're talking about a lot of different changes. So, will this this will fall into the master plan, or the money will? roll over, stay in the account and roll over. If it doesn't fall into the master plan, how is that all happening? I think it stays there. Um, projects that we can do, this will be for the next, wouldn't start until after the summer and you know into the fall when I think we'll have more definitive information from the master plan on what they're looking to, what we're looking to do. Um, some of these things need to happen regardless, the stonewall work, the invasive species, some of that. Um, some of the signage is going to happen. They may direct us or help us with respect to what type of signage we put there, but we need addi some additional signage, even with all of their different um, recommendations. There's different kiosks with signage around the park. So some of the monies will be allocated by them as suggestions to us, and then we would use it if it's something that, you know, they decide the, as the committee and as the town and as you as the town council decide, you know, we don't need the parking lot paved for whatever reason, then we wouldn't, we'd just acknowledge that and move forward. And not utilize the money and then rip it up if indeed they wanted to get rid of a parking lot, you know, or, or something of that nature. Right. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? If not, I think we're probably ready to move on to CIP. Um, and Matt, how do you want to walk through this? There, uh, the way that we have it structured this year, it looks like there's a, a, a variety of, of CIP funds, you know, sort of broken out by department. Do you want to walk us through this as an overview and then we can get into some of the, the more detailed questions that Penny was bringing up earlier? Or how would you like to approach this? That, that'd be great yeah, if we can look at this as an overview and then and then come back to it. Uh, I will say, uh, yeah, you will find this year we did have a reorganization. Uh, and to John's credit, he did a great job with this to change it from the 715, which was that exhaustive list, as you recall, uh, from looking at it uh, at, to, to new counselors. It's something that you don't have to, uh, to try to endure. So uh, by having this reorganized, hopefully this will be an easier easier mechanism by which to evaluate uh, the capital projects as they come forward. Uh, this morning, uh, 
you may have received that email from me that showed a more of a consolidated, uh, yes, exactly, consolidated uh, spreadsheet uh, that kind of, instead of having it on the multiple pages that begin at page 209 in your budget book, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I overshot my, my landing zone there. Um, let's see, on one. 191, I believe. 191, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this brings it all together into one, onto one page, so you can take a look at that. Uh, but you'll notice on, in the 2000 at the top, that's public works infrastructure. And that uh, is mostly of, uh, of like your, what, what you would call your infrastructure projects, such as paving and drainage improvements. Uh, that's an annual uh, operation, uh, operational expense, uh, the Willowbrook culverts replacement that we spoke about the other night. And then uh, going further down, uh, it, the organization would next be for public works, vehicles and equipment. Uh, as uh, Councilor Jordan was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, looking at this would be where the, the loader backhoe replacement would be. And then uh, further down from there, public works buildings and grounds. And uh, this would have, uh, I guess this would be a good spot for, uh, you know, for where you're looking at different projects on buildings and grounds throughout the town, throughout our facilities. And then uh, going down from there into the engineering component for public works. Uh, so in the future, if we were looking to add additional planning and uh, engineering per se, uh, kettle cove drainage uh, or other infrastructure projects for for, uh, for planning and engineering, that would fall under there. Uh, and then uh, from there, you go down to your specific departments. So you'd have your police department, fire department, and then facilities. And facilities would be a catch-all for for all of the uh, all the town buildings uh, across the board. Uh, Number of these we've we've spoken about earlier. Uh, the paving and the paving program and drainage improvements. That's an annual uh, capital item that we do have, uh, but it's large. It's large enough ticket item that, uh, it, and it is infrastructure. That uh, that's a consistent number that we've had uh, for quite a long time, as well as sidewalk and uh, pedestrian pedest pedestrian improvements. Uh, so that uh, those are fairly, Those are a couple of the constants. And then uh, the other items that we have in there, uh, you'll you'll see, and we've had those for for quite a long time as well. Uh, the Kettle Cove drainage improvements, you'll notice on uh, line 5101, uh, we had originally put in $350,000 for that. Uh, I spoke about this a bit the other night as well. We've pushed that off until next year, uh, unless stimulus funds come forward that are specific to that project. Uh, we are looking to partner with Portland Water District for that project in next year. Uh, as, as we were talking about the, the, the 1929 water line that's out in that section of town. Uh, so they're they're motivated to work with us. And uh, I see Jay nodding because he was, uh, you know, thanks to him and to Steve Harding for having those conversations and identifying that as for them to be our our our, our co uh, co participant in that. But if if we do find that there are new CARES Act Funding form fundings, uh, funding vehicles available for that uh, for both us and the Portland Water District. This may be an item that, that is shoved. It is an item that's shovel ready. Uh, so we we would be we are poised to strike if both organizations can can do that. Uh, moving down further into that, uh, and we can come back to this in a moment if 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 that's fine with the council. Uh, that would be the public works vehicles and equipment that that Councilor Jordan had had mentioned earlier. Uh, and the next on public works, uh, uh, buildings and grounds, the item of note there uh, would be Spurwick Schoolhouse parking lot. And that's $100,000 that we have estimated for that project uh, to have that done. This is integral to getting Spurwick Schoolhouse redeployed to be a functional building. Uh, without the parking, uh, they, they are pretty much stuck at square one to go any further in the planning process. Uh, speaking with the town planner about this, uh, they need, that is an item that will need to be uh, an item that needs to be answered. So if that that's kind of the first domino that needs to needs to be uh, addressed. You'll notice uh, 5106 street lights LED conversion uh, coming back this evening. Uh, Jay and I had a very productive meeting yesterday morning at 11 with CMP, and uh, they have since sent sent us forward. Uh, a contract uh, for discussion uh, currently with Mike Hill to be reviewed and we will have this hopefully for an actionable item for the council at the April 12th meeting. 
uh, this would be to convert all of the all of the street lights. I think it was Jay. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think 376 is the number for street lights that we do have in town. Uh, they'll convert all of those at no cost, uh, at, and with uh, an annual savings of uh, 18 to 20 thousand uh, dollars in year one, uh, as from a, from an energy consumption item. Uh, so that's it's great that we can actually accomplish that goal uh, without any capital outlay and we don't have to maintain them or have any of the uh, attributable uh, responsibilities that would come with owning 376 somewhat lights in the town of Cape Elizabeth. So uh, they were great to work with and so we'll have that brought forward hopefully for then and, and then look to have deployment take place uh, Presumably late June, early July is if we get on the if we get on the timetable early. So, um, so I'm excited about that as well as avoiding two hundred thousand dollars in expense uh, on the on the town's budget this year. So, uh, and then on the police side, are of they it, just uh, being nice? What? <laughs> no, it's well, well. To be frank, it's the whole. It's the Gillette form of marketing, right? You know, they they. they they want to sell power, and this is a way for them to make sure that they sell power, as well. But it's a it's a pro. They they do not want to lose. Uh, I don't know. They they don't lose market share when it comes to that. It's okay. Yeah, they did the same. You know, and the thing is, Westbrook did it. I talked to Jerry Bryant, uh, the manager over there. I'm like, Jerry, is this for real? And you know, Westbrook's in the process of converting their lights. He said, Yeah, Matt is. One of the easiest decisions I've ever made as a manager, and I know Gray converted all of their lights last year, as well. So, yeah, they. I don't know. When you when you see a decent decent offer, I'm I'm usually happy to happy to jump into that, as well as you know, aligning it with the council's goals for uh, for energy efficiency, as well as uh, lessening our carbon footprint. But they're they're very excited about it, uh, and then. Uh, looking at the at the police side of it, I know Chief Fenton spoke about uh, his capital uh, request uh, the other uh, on, mon on Monday evening, as well as Chief Gleason with uh, the replacement of engine engine two, and then uh, from there on the rest of that on under facilities, a lot of that is is routine maintenance and and repairs uh, to the uh, to to the town's buildings, and then finally uh, the green belt tra trail improvements that uh, Mitch Waxman and Maureen spoke of the other night as a, as a capital capital expense. And then uh, the other item you'll notice is uh, on the on the larger page, uh, the how to, or you'll notice across the top, the way the mechanism by which uh, these items will be funded. So as you break across the top, uh, it identifies those that will be attributable to being paid by uh, property taxes, those that are being paid by fund balance, uh, carry forwards, and then grant funding. And then finally, under borrowed funds, uh, and and uh, John Q did speak of that a bit the other evening about what we're anticipating at a two and I think two and a half percent uh, for the five-year period uh, for for that as a funding mechanism. Great, thank you, Matt, for that um, overview of a lot. I, I think what I would suggest uh, is that if we all kind of move back to to um, the start of the 2000s on page 191 and work our way through with questions that we have for the manager sort of somewhat systematically. Um, I think that would probably be helpful for everyone. And um, I, um, I just wanted to start off by, with, by saying thank you for, for laying the capital budget out this way. I think this is a really helpful way to, to view it from my perspective. Um, I, I really appreciate this. Um, I, I think one thing that I appreciated in, in the way that we looked at CIP last in previous years that I'm not seeing in here was sort of, um, I know last, well, last couple of years, um, Bob had included sort of a, a forecast into out years um, for, for some of the, the, the road projects that we're, we may be facing two to three years out. Um, and if, if there's a way that we could get a preview of, of that um, included in this view somehow, um, that would be appreciated. Mr. Chair, we, we do have that and I can, uh, I can email that to council. Jay, Jay provided that uh, for me as well. Great. So we'll get that forward to you tomorrow. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I guess starting with um, starting with with the uh, public works infrastructure, are there, do any councilors have questions about the, these capital improvement budgets. 
or items, excuse me. Jay. I can also add a little bit of supplemental info and maybe they will answer some questions you might have just to um, piggyback on, on Matt's uh, great presentation of the CIP throughout. I have a, a little cheat sheet in front of me here that is a reminder that uh, I'm one thing that Matt and I have in common is that we like to um, go after grant money and secure grant money so that we don't have to pay uh, with tax dollars. So that's something he and I have in common. So I, I did want to mention that um, there are several projects in here that the numbers in the budget are for the full projects. So that's the fully funded amount. Um, for example, the Willowbrook culvert uh, at 418. And as you probably have heard, we have, uh, are in the process of securing a grant uh, through the Maine Natural Resources Conservation Program. We requested 343,000 and they have um, initially conditionally approved 258,000 to go towards that project. And that's still pending. Uh, they're still working on that, but that's, um, you know, that's more than more than half of that project. Uh, the other is with regards to Kettle Cove boat launch and the Kettle Cove drainage project. So um, a few months ago, PACS, our regional transportation agency, was anticipating federal stimulus dollars, and uh, they were looking for projects in the region uh, for which they could be uh, shovel ready. And uh, we identified these two as potential projects to be funded uh, with federal money. So we have... Um, included those on, on the list with PACS, uh, along with several other projects um, in other areas of the CIP. Uh, for example, the under the engineering in the 2003, which is on page 194, the Shore Road preliminary engineering design work, we have uh, also applied for funds through PACS, uh, through their, um, their sub-regional MPI program uh, to fund half of that. So uh, we're, we're hopeful that we will not have to spend a lot of the uh, total amount of the, the budget numbers that are in the capital plan. Um, Jay, uh, I look forward to seeing the, the out years document, but uh, while, while we've got you, would, if, would you mind just sort of hitting the highlights on that too? If there's any, you know, sort of, I guess it'd be, 2022, 20, 23 projects that are sort of looming in your in your view. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm looking uh, forward to. Sure, sure. Uh, a lot of the in, in small projects are related to paving and drainage work, uh, which can be paid for through the annual uh, recurring, you know, paving and overlay uh, program. Uh, the the big one that is on the radar, the big one is, is the Shore Road project. And I, I know there's been sort of a, a start to that. There's been some preliminary discussions and you know, this fiscal year we're, we're asking for the preliminary design to rebuild Shore Road from uh, about Fort Williams Park to the South Portland line. And that would uh, be a, a complete reconstruction and a modernization of that, that roadway. Uh, pedestrian improvements, bicycle improvements, um, narrowing of lane widths, uh, you know, trying to do some traffic calming, some streetscape amenities and things of the like. Uh, similar to Kettle Cove drainage, the water district has a hundred year old water line running down Shore Road that, Shore Road that they need to replace. So it would be uh, an infrastructure and streetscape project. Um, that's, that's about two years out and it's it's in the millions of dollars um, with preliminary estimates. So, you know, we have to think about that in the next year or so, whether, you know, the town wants to, uh, you know, fund that partially through, you know, a voter referendum and or through tax base or, or other means. We certainly will be targeting that um, for all sorts of uh, grant options, we have included that in the stimulus project list uh, and, and other lists as future projects for uh, consideration for funding. But that's that's the big one. That's the big one that's on the list. Uh, we are moving forward with that Willowbrook culvert. And, you know, there are other larger culverts in town that, that we've assessed 
that are on our radar as well. The next one up probably would be on Mitchell Road. Uh, so that's that's another um, not not in the in the size of Shore Road. Shore Road certainly is is uh, is big is a big project. Uh, but that would be the next um, capital that we would uh, you know be looking for in the next couple of years. Those that's are those the are the two. Brook one, Jay. I'm sorry. That's the Pond Cove Pond Cove Brook culvert on Mitchell. Um, it's Hobstone? here. Yes, Hobstone, exactly. So those those are those are two uh, of worthy mention. I, I have mentioned a few others in a in a three year outline that I did provide uh, in a narrative to Matt, and I'd, I'd be happy to to get that to all of you so you see what we're thinking um, for the short term. Great. Thank you for that overview. Um, I guess I'll, I'll pause and come back to see if there's any questions from counselors. Valerie? Thank, thank you, Jay, for that overview. But it's, it's my understanding about the Shore Road project. Uh, we were looking at a year ago, we were looking at about three years. So two years from now, and they were saying 25 million. So I'm guessing it's now going to be at least 30 million with this with costs going up um is that about accurate what you're thinking for sure for sure road sure road I'm sorry council never yeah you, you almost gave me a heart attack uh i think we're like three and a half to five. Oh, oh, oh it's five yeah, million. Right. <laughs> oh i don't want to give you a heart attack i think they have better switch to decaf but it was uh <laughs> no that was uh uh, yeah, we we're, we're lined up in that in that in that window of the three and a half to five, depending upon the scope and scale of the uh, if it's a full uh, full depth reconstruction or if there's uh, uh, parts that that will not require that. So the depth of that uh, reconstruction kind of drives that. Okay, so in the we're year you're accurate with the year twenty twenty four is still kind of the target. Okay, because I'm just thinking about. Um, uh, school and other things we're looking at uh, to bond. So we would be bonding that also, Matt? That, that would be part of it. We'd also be, and uh, as Jay uh, led into this so well, uh, we'd also be considering uh, flexing into some of the state uh, transit funds or state um, MPI funds or other uh, funding vehicles that we would find to help offset that, that cost. So if we could find something where we could do perhaps say a 50% match or something along those lines, or if there's federal funds that may exist out there because it's awful hard to spend $3 trillion uh, in, a, in a short period of time, although we could probably do it. Uh, there may be some of those funds available as well at that time. Uh, so if we can get into that queue, uh, that would also be a good thing. But uh, whether, our, whether our state and federal funds available, we will be pursuing those aggressively. Okay, great, thank you. But, yep, you're welcome. Questions from other counselors? Um, Jay, I, I just note, and I, I don't, this is probably not even right for action yet, but I'd note um, that um, at the Fort Williams Park Committee meeting last night, um, I had some of the recommendations that are being prepared by the, uh, the consultants involve use of some of the secondary access points to the park, um, potentially for, for as a bus entrance, um, you know, still a ways to go to see if that's going to make its way into the final document. But um, just wondering if there's room to include some of that, at least in the design work, if not in the need for final build um, for the planning work on the shore road upgrade. Um, it, you know, it, more, more a placeholder than a question, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know that the intersection at the entrance to the park and uh, Little John uh, is, you know, the, I know Steve Harding and Sebago Technics have taken a close look at that and, and have considered some changes there as far as queuing lanes uh, potentially and, and improving access at that particular location. And we'll, we'll certainly um, keep our ears uh, to the wall when it comes to what, what the uh, committee is gonna recommend for uh, access and um, and movement changes. Thank you. Yeah. Penny, do you want to dive into public works vehicles questions or did you get those answered already? 
Oh, no, I still, I, um, and I recognize how Matt has uh, uh, identified the funding, but I always think that there's a way that one doesn't need everything because I can't buy all the equipment I want all the time. So my brother gets his tractors, I don't get my truck, but, um, but I really would like to know what the utility tractor replacement, I understand its use, but there must be something currently in service. Um, and, um, and the ground maintenance equipment, um, it sounds like that is uh, additional equipment. And so how does that work in combination with the um, utility tractor? Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out, I understand the loader backhoe and I, I buy that rationale 100%. So I'm not even going there. Um, but those two things seem somewhat um, similar and there must be current equipment in service. And, um, and is it that close to the end of its useful life? That's my question. And Jay, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I, I did uh, look up some additional information to help out on that. Um, so the utility tractor is a 2007. That's our current unit that we use. Okay. Uh, so that would be approaching 15 years in FY22. It's, it's getting close to the end. Um, that is one of our primary mowing uh, pieces of equipment. So it does, like I say, have a fork and bucket attachment option where it does uh, multiple different things at multiple different facilities, but primarily that is that is the mower is being um, operated pretty much full time from spring to fall, uh, and it is one of our pieces of equipment that you know helps us keep up uh, with keeping all the athletic fields at, at the school campus uh, ready to play on, and uh, all the other facilities for that matter. But the the big driver is is definitely the the athletic fields at the school campus. Um, being able to, to cover all that square footage of, of green grass over there, both on the playing fields and off as well. So that's, that's what it is. I did also, um, I should note that my staff has recommended that we upsize that slightly. So that's why there is an increase in that particular cost for that particular, particular unit. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. With regards to the grounds maintenance equipment, uh, you are correct. That is a new uh, piece of equipment. So that is actually what's called a slice seeder. So what that is, is a different type of unit that uh, allows you to seed, um, continue to seed areas. One, for good turf management. Two, to, to uh, push out uh, invasives and, and other things uh, on the surfaces. And three, allows us to do that in-house versus hiring uh, outside contractual services to do that work. So we currently um, hire that out. And uh, one inefficiency is we have, to, we have to wait for a contractor's schedule to, to be available to do those types of things. And it's one of those things that you, you have to time uh, correctly or else you, know, you don't wanna be seeding in August because now you just have to pump water to it all, all month. So um, that is a new piece of equipment. So you know, that's, that's for consideration. And you know, I, I understand the times and, and uh, the fiscal needs. Uh, so I guess if, if there was one that couldn't make it to the list, it might be that one. Oh, huh. um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um i'm sorry uh anyway i'll share with the group i'll share with the group i said to penny <laughs> that the way to solve that problem on mowing and field maintenance is more turf fields so for those that for those that went through the oh boy <laughs> spring discussion on that last year so anyway i thought that was so cute um so the existing um, utility tractor, which we're, we're replacing and we're uh, upsizing. Will the existing one stay in service for other purposes? No, we would trade that in. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, I'll be, uh, within the next few moments, you'll be receiving a uh, the Public Works Department CIP narrative uh, 22 
FY22 to 24 that uh, that you'll you'll have in your inboxes here shortly as well. So thank uh, you. Thanks. Yep. Sorry about the interruption. No, no worries, Valerie. I just want to follow up, Jay, with um, with Penny's question on the grounds uh, maintenance equipment. So you said that purchasing this will offset um, outside the cost of an outside contract. Do you know what that cost is uh, by any chance? I would have to do a little bit of research. I don't have that right in front of me um, because the contractor that we use also does other contractual services. So I, I would have to pull the, pull those numbers out and I can certainly um, do that and, and get that, that to you. But it sounds like it'd be a wash then. Um, so it's not really costing us anything if we're not paying a contractor. Right, I mean, the, the, the costs would offset themselves. So rather than having uh, say four or five thousand dollars annual in contractual services, uh, the cost would be borne with the uh, capital equipment purchase, and then the work would be done in house. So it would pay for itself, and actually, it would um, it would cost us less money by having this equipment in year four, five, six, seven. Correct. So if if I multiplied out say fifteen years for an equipment life cycle. Uh, and the cost that we spend uh, year over year for contractual services, I could I could show in uh, an analysis pretty quick that it, it pays for itself, along with the efficiencies of being able to complete the work, you know, on, on our terms that, you know, during our schedule and uh, timing wise, it would be more efficient that way. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, if there's other questions for Jay, I'm sure we can come back, but I'm going to suggest maybe we move on to the next set, uh, the 2002. Um, so this is Public Works, and I guess this is still Jay, um, Public Works and Grounds. And uh, I think Matt teed this up, and I, I can also provide just a quick um, brief supplemental summary. Uh, the Village Green Irrigation, that would be uh, for next to the town hall, where we have the plaza, the monument, and uh, the new flags uh, to add a new uh, irrigation system to keep that um, green looking green. Uh, and would you know it's a, it's a premier location and uh, prime viewing area. So we thought that it justified um, putting that additional infrastructure in to keep it looking as good as we possibly can. Uh, so that's uh, that's the first item in, in public works, buildings and grounds. The second one, uh, actually, I'm glad Kathy is still here. Uh, I heard her say that the miscellaneous to be determined projects in Fort Williams Park Capital actually includes the tennis court resurfacing. So I think I may not have realized uh, what my role was with regards to Fort Williams CIP. So I apologize that we may have double budgeted this particular item. But I think I, it's um, the estimate that I got was almost $20,000 for the work. Um, and if we had any other additional things, yeah, maybe we need to share some of the expenses with that. And we had talked if you were just recently about the stairs at the picnic shelter parking lot for $7,500 that may come out of my funds as well. So between the two of us, I think we'll cover the tennis courts and the stairs at the park. Okay, so that is still needed. And then the third one, I think Matt, did you, uh, you mentioned the Spurwink school parking lot. I'd probably defer to you for more information on that particular project, if any is needed. Yeah, I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know last year we, we did explore uh, under considerable detail, the opportunity to try to renovate and rehab uh, the building uh, at a significant expense and uh, this is kind of the first step to try to get to that to that point, at least to get the property reused at, uh, in the future. So, uh, without this, we can't we can't get to step to step two when it comes to that. So, Matt, I'll um, I see Jamie's got your hand up, but I'll just lead in with an initial question: Is so this would be paving for what's currently the lawn area adjacent to the Spurwink School, and it would be accessed from the existing library parking area? Is that the the, the concept? 
yeah, almost with the, I think visually you would look at kind of like an island between the two uh, parking lots stretching out from where, as the sidewalk comes across there now, uh, as you come around the circle in front of the library. And then there would be an access loop coming back in and then a small parking lot uh, in a rectangular format, uh, right uh, budding, uh, running parallel or beyond the extent of the current uh, parking area. That would be the, create the a number of allowable parking spaces needed for that square footage. Okay. Oh, so th this is this is also partially driven by a, by a codes issue in terms of having the adequate parking for the yep. building. Okay. Yep, that's the primary driver because if if you uh, because of the change in use so that they have uh, quite frankly for anything at this point in time, uh, planner has advised that that needs to have the parking needs to be addressed before anything can can go forward. So and that's based on square footage of the of the building. Thank you, Jamie. Um, my question was not in anything in opposition to the expense, but I get I guess if you could just explain the order of operations a little bit more clearly on that, Matt, because it, it seems counterintuitive to me to spend the high dollar item for something that's not the, the rest of the plan hasn't progressed as far as I would have expected to be doing this, I guess. I guess. So um, if you could just better help me understand or help all of us understand the sequencing here? Sure, yeah, uh, well, uh, over the course of last summer uh, and uh, early in the fall, I had a lot of conversations with Ellen Van Fleet as well as uh, as we were looking at the at the property uh, to see, and they they were interested in just moving in and trying, and then trying over the years to, to try to work with the town to, to improve the building that way versus coming up with a million dollar plus or minus expense to just go in and do a full, full demo, uh, full, you know, renovation of, of the building. Uh, so I said, you know, I spoke with Maureen about it and said, hey, can, you know, can they just get in, maybe establish what they want to do, uh, work on their collection, and then uh, over time peck away at it. And the answer was no. You can't, you, even if they wanted to just move in there to start doing any type of, uh, you know, in, uh, inhabiting the building and, and, and trying to establish that as the home for the historical society, uh, Nothing can take place, even if we wanted to go back in there uh, uh, to do anything. Uh, you need to we need okay. to have the parking done. So that's just that alone. I, I wasn't at all clear that there was anything that was contemplated for them, because I thought even based on my recollection from their requirements, there was work needed to be done to make it suitable to their need, even if it wasn't, you know, the you know, the full vision of what it may become in the future, but that there was even a certain amount of base level work that needed to be done before they could have reasonable use of the, of the building, so. It, they, they feel that they may be able to do some of that work with volunteers or, uh, but mm -hmm. it would be inhabiting the first, you know, the, the first floor, not the basement area, which has its own right. challenges, but. Uh, that's that's pretty much what we were looking at there, even as an option for them to do it. But yeah, the parking was the. I guess I was thinking more of the HVAC stuff and climate control and and um, uh, security kinds of things. Yeah, and I think that and the, you know they'd like to look at, address that over time versus all at once, and uh, and then you know we could have a longer multi-phase plan versus uh, biting the bullet. So will they still need to occupy space at the public safety building concurrently then for some of the holdings? The thought is, if they do, it won't be anywhere as near as much uh, as currently is there. So uh, we could work on on along those lines as well. Okay. And I'll just interject for the benefit of new counselors and any members of the public who may come back and watch this. Um, we're we're discussing paving a, a parking area for the Spurwing School adjacent to the library, which. Uh, we had uh, last year looked at a plan from the Historical Society to move records that they're storing on behalf of the town over there, as well as have some community space associated with that use and um, determined that it wasn't feasible to, you know, take that whole project on at the time. But it sounds like there's pieces of it that might be able to move forward. So. Any other questions on that or comments from counselors? Penny? I have something. So uh, 
so Matt, I think it's great that you and Ellen have been having conversation uh, because it's sad to see that building just sit and uh, kind of atrophy. Um, and so um, I personally think we need to get somebody in there, some action going on in there, or it's just going to continue to deteriorate. Um, so does this say that uh, hypothetically, if we get the parking, um, we agreed to get the parking set up and, and ready to go, uh, we probably want to set a time and um, sometime after the budget stuff to sit down with the historic uh, preservation society again and talk about uh, their thoughts, their plans, what it means, how that chipping away might look, et cetera. Is that kind of where you're headed? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm at. And uh, my, my big thing was getting the primary blocker out of the way uh, first, so then we could then have those discussions with, with the historical society because <laughs> it's been, you know, this conversation has been going on. I think Councilor Garvin could, can testify to that as okay, on, exactly. the, on the, on okay. the original, <laughs> uh, uh, study committee. So uh, I would love to see that going forward. And uh, it's, it's the proper home for, for the historical society. It would just, it would just be great uh, to have that there, but you got to get that darn roadblock of no parking out of the way. Yeah, but I, I think they're kind of right that once you get in the space, it's easier to start that fundraising thing and um, uh, getting dollars to achieve their ultimate yeah. vision. So, yeah. Great. Um, so th I think that brings us up through the capital and um, capital uh, investment items that are included through page 194, unless anyone has any additional questions on the preliminary design budget item for Shore Road. Okay. Um, so I, I'll just, there's a, a lot of, there's a couple, only a couple items in here from public safety. Um, and I guess if anyone has any questions on those, um, hopefully Matt can respond to them. Yep, I'd be happy to if there are. Hearing none, uh, does anyone have any questions for Perry on any of the items included on page 197? I actually, I do, Jeremy, real quick. Yeah, this please. is a small one. Sorry, but the public works flagpole, is that a replacement or? It is. It's a. It is. Yeah, it was taken down in a bad storm. What, Perry, oh. four years ago? It was like a year and a half ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is, yeah. That yeah. big storm that knocked out a bunch of trees and we had no power for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thought every time I went to recycling committee. <laughs> yeah, and that's a flagpole with lighting. Oh, okay. It took down. Right. We had a huge. Uh, what was that? Like a blue spruce nickel that was there, and it took down that and. Oh, no, no. Flagpole, and uh, yeah, it was a wet and wind event. Okay, just a curiosity. Thank okay. you. Thank you for that. And then uh, one item of note, if I if I could, Mr. Chairman, uh, to bring in here, we do have the uh, uh, electric vehicle charging stations in uh, on this as well, and there is grant funding that will be coming to that project as well in the in the amount of sixteen thousand or up to 16,000 per, per installation. So that's why you see, see that in there. Matt, are those the final locations, the community center and- Yes, in that, in that Fort Williams Park. Yep. Okay. And they're, they're both for four head uh, charging stations and, they, uh, and the electricity is not provided for free. It's, uh, they're, they're looking to be networked so a person can swipe, charge and go. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I guess the, before we uh, move on to the fee schedule, I think that's the last item that we have um, on this. I'll just, I, I'd like to actually, let, let's move on to that and then we'll come back and see if anyone has any questions on things we've already covered um, under item three. So Matt, do we, you wanna, What's the what's the recommended or what are, what are we looking at and what's the action here? <laughs> on the on the on the fee schedule, um, 
Well, Mr. Chairman, you, you have my apologies. I realized I did not get to send that to you today. Uh, and I meant to, we can look at that again if you'd like to at the next uh, review session. We do have some recommendations on there. Uh, not not a lot of them, but it's good to update it. So if, if we, we could push that to our next uh, our next budget uh, item, that would that would be great. And I apologize, Debbie sent it to me this morning, and uh, it's been one of those Zoom days. So I will make sure I get that to you. Not a worry. No no worries, and I'm glad I'm not going insane. No <laughs> no no. But, uh, that's that would be me. Okay. Um, Great. So I'd just like to pause there. Um, and in addition to the fee schedule, ask if counselors, if there's any um, items that counselors have additional questions on, either that we covered tonight or last night um, that, that merit further discussion, or if the, if the manager has any, um, any points that, you know, he, he is looking for additional clarity from us on in terms of the budget at this point. I have, I don't have any specific items, but one of the things that as we went through this budget, and I know we said we were going to do this, I've kept the, the our council goals in front of me on, um, and, and Matt, I'm assuming that these goals have been shared with all department heads with explanation around them so that they're factored in to decision-making as we move through the year and expend dollars? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, we, um, the council goals were approved as we were going to press with the, with this document. Otherwise I would have tried to mm -hmm. have it up at the, at the front of it, but uh, okay. all of our operations are looking to be in alignment. And uh, the big theme, as you probably noticed uh, on this, would, would be uh, would be on energy efficiency. It was the was the early goal that I think we've always been trying to accommodate, but is 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 very much addressed in this year's in this year's budget more so than uh, or or to a greater extent, I guess, in this year's budget than prior years. Uh, mm -hmm. But as we, as we do go through, our operations are are looking to be fully in alignment with this year's council goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as I look at them, it's like, because I know we're going to be hearing over the next uh, uh, several months all of the uh, opportunities that could uh, arise as a result of $1.9 trillion. Um, and so everybody has their radar up around opportunity. Um, and then we look at, and I already said this to Perry, that, um, you know, incorporating new uh, technologies as we look at addressing infrastructure. Um, and, and so it's like, uh, I just want these to really live because we put so much great work into it and they're in such a good format that they're easy to take action on. So um, I'm gonna keep them in front of me throughout the year. Um, and so as we make decisions, I think we map back to this. Okay. Yep. I, I think that's an excellent point, Penny. Um, and I'm just looking down, our, our last item um, on the agenda tonight is, is a review of the, the, up, you know, the remaining schedule for the budget review. Um, and in particular, if we need to have any, uh, whether we need to have any adjustments to items on the CIP budget or anywhere else in the budget here um, for the meeting that we have scheduled, if needed, um, on April 27th, um, that might be a good opportunity to just go back mm. through the budget and, and check to see how well it aligns with the council goals and if there, there may, may, may be any additional changes needed at that time. Because I think about like with Kathy tonight and we're talking about community services and we talked a lot about um, our uh, uh, needs and, you know, a healthy community for all of the ages and things like that. So as each department had looked at these goals, kind of creating um, uh, programming or uh, around it, like the library, we really want to leverage that, creating programming around that. Overall, the budget that was put forward, um, I tried so hard to find something that I could cut. I really did. Um, because I go, you just can't always get what you want. 
Uh, I think there's a song like that, but um, but it's it's a good solid budget. Um, but I think we're going to have to, and I'll go through it again, figure out if there's something it's got to give, what will it be? And I would I would think that Matt already has in the back of his head. If we got it, if we got to cut something, what would it be? Uh, I don't. I think it's a pretty solid budget as it sits right now. Thanks, Penny. Um, other, yeah, Jamie. Um, yeah, I, I was, um, my, you know, mindful of what we had just talked about, like like you, Penny, and I think everybody else, you know, was was keeping an eye on on the goals. Um, both Monday and tonight. And I think, um, you know, a lot of those goal sections probably relate to it. And maybe we need to have a, a completely separate, you know, from the fiscal year budget discussion, completely separate meeting and workshop focusing on um, what came up earlier. And that's more longer range planning, capital projects, out years. You know, if you think about some of those things in the budget around, uh, in the goals rather around, you know, cellular coverage and sidewalks and neighborhood connectivity and all those kinds. Those aren't anything that are going to be in a single budget year, most of them, right? But they're going to be things that, like the Shore Road project, well, $160,000 is going to be, um, I'm sorry, $1.6 million is going to be in, um, no, I, I have that right, $160,000, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is going to be in you know, a single fiscal year, right? So doing, so if, it, you know, if, if a long range goal is, you know, sidewalks on Fowler and Mitchell and a couple other places, well, you know, what are we funding next year and the year beyond that and the year beyond that to start moving towards that? If a long range goal is some sort of locally deployed cellular network, what are we doing for that? And so I, we, we never have that discussion really as we're doing these fiscal year budget reviews. And I think, I think we probably need to pull up to that level um, to have a more comprehensive longer range plan around that. I, I, so I, I appreciate that perspective um, from both, both of you. I think those are both valuable points. And, and I, I think I'll come back to the original suggestion that Perhaps um, we should consider holding on to that April 27th date. It's in the calendar now on an if needed basis. Um, but I, I think it might be worthwhile for us to consider holding on to that date to start some of those um, discussions around longer term financial planning issues. And if I could, I, I think it's going to become all the more important. Um, and, you know, Jeremy, it's really stuff that. You know, you and I should be continuing to talk about when we have our, our joint meetings with the um, school board leadership. But when you start to think about and and you know, Councilor Devereaux referred to it earlier. You know, any kind of bonding associated with school projects and stuff like that. Like all of that has to be in one big picture and one single view, so that we're we know where the pieces are on the chessboard um, as it relates to some of these things. So. Yeah, and between the, I mean, I think those are those are likely the big the big ones, right? The the shore road rebuild and and the school, but you know when you've got more than one project with six zeros behind it, you know, coming up in the foreseeable future, thinking about when and how you schedule those projects for completion makes a difference. Um, so I think let let's hold a place for that conversation on the twenty seventh, along with a couple of other items. Um, that may come up between then if we need to. Um, and I'll just go back through the remainder of that calendar real quickly. So uh, we will have our regular council meeting on April 12th. There'll be an opportunity for comment from the public on the budget then, followed by a finance committee meeting with the school budget presentation on Monday, April 26th at 6 p.m. So that'll be us hearing from the school budget committee on, on their proposed budget for the year. Um, as a reminder, they're, they're working their way through their budget process now, um, and those meetings are um, also available for counselors and other members of the public to follow along. Um, I'm hearing that we should, or I'm suggesting that we should hold the Tuesday, April 27th meeting, um, and probably, Matt, um, it, I think it might be worthwhile to invite at least the school board chair and, um, and finance committee 
um, chair as well um, to have some of those longer range financial planning decisions or discussions then um, uh, around out years. Um, and then we would have a special council meeting on Monday, May 3rd for the budget hearing followed by a vote on our regular council meeting on May 10th. And then this would be on the ballot um, for the election that's scheduled for June 8th. Um, so that is our, our calendar uh, moving forward. I don't think we're gonna make Matt go back and, and do his homework a second time this year like we did last year. Um, <laughs> you, you're about to God's ears, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if, if, yeah. I, if I may interrupt you, you were on an awesome roll. Uh, I just didn't know if you wanted to go through the special revenue funds as well. Um, why don't we? Why don't we add that on for? Oh, I'm sorry. We have we have this. Sorry, we. I, I totally looked overlooked those. You're right. Um, yeah. Why don't we do that now? And then I I know see we have still a couple members of the public, so we'll go through the special revenue funds, see if there's any public comment, and that'll be a wrap for the night. Awesome. It, it, and this this isn't a heavy uh, a heavy lift, but it's good to uh, to be able to go through. Um, and I think Jay Jay will get us started with the sewer fund uh, since we still have him here. And that would be starting on uh, page two hundred three in your in your hymnal. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, so this is uh, Department Code eight fifteen sewer fund and. Um, this is this budget is mainly driven by um, a lot of the services that the Portland Water District provides uh, to the town for collection and uh, pumping and treatment of our sewer lines. Um, so what uh, line I'm account I'm referring to is the Portland Water Assessment, which is 2071. Uh, that's the, the biggest of the, the numbers. And uh, every year they do a an assessment. Uh, of our sewer uh, usage, uh, how many million gallons a day are, are pumped and treated, and uh, the billing services that they provide to the town um, basically incorporates uh, all of the, the sewer fund, uh, the sewer program, I should say, into that Portland Water District assessment. So Matt and I met with uh, Portland Water District staff Oh, when was that? Sometime through the winter, and uh, they provided the the new assessment there, which they do annually uh, every year for the town. And uh, that number, that one point eight five three, is their uh, projected assessment number for the town of Cape Elizabeth as a whole. So that's uh, that's the big ticket item in this particular uh, department code. There's also a fairly sizable sewer line maintenance account in here, and that's uh, more for the sewer systems that the town maintains. So Public Works maintains all the gravity systems in, in the entire uh, collection system. And then the Portland Water District maintains all of the pump stations and force mains and interceptor lines that take it over to South Portland. Uh, so we, we've done a we've had a pretty good year on that sewer line maintenance, haven't had too, uh, too many issues. Uh, it, it is also a placeholder to uh, look forward and plan uh, ahead for future capital investments. So that line is also, uh, that's 2037 that I'm referring to, sewer line maintenance. Uh, it's also used uh, to televise our sewer systems and um, start uh, planning ahead for additional needs in the future um, to get ahead of issues before they become them. So those are really the two the two big areas. Uh, there is a little bit in the payroll uh, to fund a portion of one of the public works employees uh, to charge towards that account because we do um, we do maintenance work. Uh, we have a uh, a jetter that um, assists us with keeping lines free and clear uh, on a preventative maintenance uh, perspective. Uh, so this that's pretty much a quick summary of it, the eight fifteen sewer funds. I'd be happy to attempt to answer any questions for you. This may be a, a, a stupid question, um, but I'll ask it anyway. I get that bill from them every month that says the, the sewer rates are set by the town. And I always look at that and think, I don't remember ever voting on sewer rates. Is that, that's what this is? Like this, this is us establishing the sewer rates or is this really them telling us your sewer rates are this and then we write it into our budget? Matt, do you want to take that? Or 
you, you can get started and then I'll jump in if I need to. Sure. So I believe the sewer rate is actually part of the fee, the fee structure. Um, and the town does establish that. And so it, that's the short, that's the short answer to the, the billing side of the Portland water district. So that'll be on April 27th. We'll look at that. Yeah. yeah it, it has not changed for, uh, I want to say four years at this point in time, there was a series of prior to I'm becoming the manager that it was going up, uh, I think it might get set up at one time. I think it was 2% per year. It went up uh, for a three year period to try to uh, increase the rates. And I know the water district has spoken to Jay and I and Bob for prior to that as well to, to see if the town council would consider that. So that would be a good conversation uh, on that on the fee schedule evening. Great, thank you. Any other questions about the special fund, revenue fund for the sewers? Okay. Moving down through. Yeah. Fund yeah. 42 is, our, is the infrastructure fund. And this is, oh, sorry, Councilor Devereux, you have a question? Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. Now, this is a fund that's set aside to uh, earmark or to save for future infrastructure improvements that the town uh, needs, in a sense, trying to, to pre-fund that. Uh, you'll notice that in this year's budget, there's also a transfer out of um, $205,000, which is helping us uh, in the, in the work that we do have planned, uh, such as the shore road preliminary engineering, uh, as well as uh, uh, Willowbrook and Kettle Cove uh, access. So we're looking at, to use those funds for specifically what they have, uh, what they're designed for, and that is for infrastructure. So, uh, and then after this year, uh, you know, but this is, uh, this is funding it and transferring it, if, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question, Valerie? I, I just have a comment to make when we're done. Okay. Next up, Matt, Spurling Church. Uh, next is, yes, the Spurling Church, which is uh, fund number 47. And this is for the operation of the Spurling Church. John uh, Q and I had a good conversation yesterday about this as well. Uh, next year, I anticipate seeing this fall into a uh, regular operational uh, budget as it, uh, you know, we do have this set aside uh, currently, but uh, you know, this year was not a banner year for events at the Spurwing Church, uh, primarily due to uh, not really having any, any weddings there. Um, so that's been, that's been a challenge, but it should be, you know, in, in future years, uh, and you'll see it for next year's budget. We'll try to blend that into the regular operational budget, perhaps uh, uh, with uh, with community services or something along those lines, uh, as far as that that can go. Um, but it's a it's a low amount of income, and a uh, basically we keep the keep the lights on and the building warm and and maintain it. Any questions from counselors? All right, moving on. And next would be Riverside Cemetery. And back to back to Jay. All right, thank you. So this uh, is on page two fourteen of the budget book, eight sixty Department Code Riverside uh, Cemetery. This is uh, to operate and uh, manage the um, cemetery functions at Riverside. So it is, as you know, it's an active cemetery. So we um, have certain operational needs to. Um, to perform those services for the residents of Cape Elizabeth. Not uh, any major changes to the uh, budget compared to uh, fiscal year 21, moving to 2022. Uh, let's see, this covers a little bit of one of our parks operations uh, staff, uh, because we do a lot of mowing and weed whacking and uh, maintenance uh, lawn care and so forth in-house. So that covers um, as some of that is charged towards this account to cover that. Uh, it also uh, covers our cemetery lot coordinator uh, who works with uh, various people uh, for various uh, events and um, ceremonies and things of the like, uh, purchasing lots and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, anything really of note, not much really of note. Uh, I guess I'll stop there and, and open it up for questions if you have any. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, I know um, Devlin has brought it up 
uh, in past couple of years and, and you know for that April conversation that we have around longer range planning, um, I'm always reminded of the fact that we're running out of room there <laughs> at the cemetery and um, figuring out what, if anything, we plan to do at that point is um, just a conversation that we need to keep on the, maybe not the front burner, but um, not totally parked in the back either, so. Thank you, Jamie. That's a good reminder. And uh, the next item that we do have is the TIF, and this is uh, TIF revenue, and this is uh, funds that are generated by the town center TIF. And uh, that is all the properties in, in many ways surrounding uh, right where I am at the present moment. So as those, uh, as those revenues come in for new growth, uh, they are earmarked for, for uh, the TIF, and that is for use for town center improvements. Uh, specifically this fund in the future, in the next two years, is anticipated to do and uh, help fund the town's portion for uh, implementing sidewalks segments seven and eight, which is gonna be improvements across the street going from uh, pretty much the Pond Cove Shopping Center all the way up to Fowler Road and, uh, and funding those improvements. So uh, right now those funds are just being earmarked and saved uh, through, the TIF, through the TIF fund. Uh, not, there's no expense coming out of there. It's a fun, it'll be a fund transfer. And then on 55, which is the Thomas Jordan Trust, uh, this is uh, this is a fund that is set aside specific for uh, to, to assist uh, people of need within the community. And uh, we do have counselors who are who currently sit as trustees on that board. Uh, I will say the fund itself uh, has has experienced a significant growth this year uh, due to the, the stock market uh, uh, performing as well as it has over the past 12 months, uh, surprisingly from where it was this time last year to where it is now. Uh, I spoke with Mark Russell yesterday and looking to meet with him next week. And then uh, after speaking with him, uh, looking to pull together, uh, this is a preview of coming attractions, but for those who are trustees, uh, you will be seeing uh, an email from me to try to organize uh, a meeting. Uh, we may also, uh, you may also hear from me tomorrow as well. There may be a, another sense of immediate need uh, that we may need to get together early next week on, but uh, stay tuned for that one as well. But this is uh, this has been a very successful find, uh, but it also has done a lot of great, great, uh, it's provided a lot of great benefits to, to people of need in the community over its history. And then looking at next, we have item uh, fund number 60, which is land acquisition. And this is uh, the, the, the penny, but in this case, two pennies uh, for uh, acquiring land uh, or funding that for future, future land purchases for the town. Uh, last year, as we talked about it the other night, uh, it was funded at 16,457. And this year we're looking to do that at uh, 32,914. So it would be at two pennies on the tax rate to help towards future land uh, purchases and acquisition. And then the final we had is a uh, fund 75, which is the, uh, the, the rescue fund, which is being uh, retired and put into the, uh, put into the operational budget for uh, fire and rescue. And that is the end of the, uh, end of the line, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Matt. Uh, yeah, and I'll just note, I'm glad to see us coming back to the, the two pennies for the land acquisition fund. Um, could you remind, can you remind us what the balance in that fund is um, currently as well? Oh, goodness. Um, yes, just give me a, if you it, want to talk for a moment and I can, it can be follow. You can follow up later if, if okay. need. Okay, I can, um, I can report to that. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you that email as well, probably in the morning. Great, thank you. Um, and I would just ask if counselors have any questions on any of those special funds that Matt just covered. All right, thank you for another great evening. Um, we have four members of the public currently attending. So at this point in the agenda, um, I would open it up for public comment. If any members of the public would like to, to comment, um, please, signal by, by using the raise hand function in Zoom and we will call on you. All right, seeing none, unless I have missed an entire category of funds that we need to cover, um, I think we're done.
Valerie, yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, come back. I just want to make a comment before we end. Uh, you know, last year was um, such uh, unprecedented year, and I just really want to thank Matt for stepping up to the plate. Last year, this time, he had all the apart the department heads put together a budget, delivered it to us. And then what was it, 10 days later, <laughs> he went back to all the department heads, had them rewrite the budget and delivered it to us again. Uh, it was pretty phenomenal. And not only did um, Matt step up to the plate, but all the department heads did also. They worked on the budget, they cut budgets. They brought us a budget that was, um, uh, not only fiscally responsible, but I really felt that it was also fair and balanced. So it didn't impact our residents um, severely because, um, you know, none of us had a crystal ball at the time or knew what was going to happen. And I just want to say that, um, Matt, you did such a good job with the budget and balancing it when, um, this was something that none of us had ever gone through before. We just didn't know what it was gonna look like. And if you look now at um, last year's budget and where we are at the budget, it looks like he did have a crystal ball. So kudos to you, Matt, you did a great job and so did your department heads. And I really wanna thank you for all that hard work. That's it paid off. It. paid off, paid <laughs> off. That's so kind, thank, thank you and yeah, you, you, you you, you said a mouthful of their Councilor Devereaux as far as uh, the department heads. I, we are truly blessed as you've noticed uh, all the different presentations we've seen this week. I get to work with awesome people, really from, from top to bottom. Uh, you got a great team, that's that's all I can say. Uh, thank you there, the, for, your, for your support on that and we look forward to another good year and hopefully this is the only document we have to provide you this year. Thank, thank you on that. And thank you for, for reminding us of that, Valerie. I think that, you know, we've touched on it as we've gone along, but uh, not only did has the manager and the department heads done an excellent job of implementing last year's budget, which we went into with a great deal of uncertainty. Um, I, you know, I think this is also a great opportunity to reflect on the fact that, you know, in a year when we frankly didn't know what municipal services would look like uh, over the course of the year. Uh, I, I think we've really just had a banner year. I mean, the all of the departments and all of the staff have really done a, a, a fantastic job sort of meeting and exceeding the annual expectations for excellence that we have. So um, I hope that's come across in our questions and comments <laughs> through the budget process. And if it hasn't, um, thank you again. Thank you. With that, unless anyone has any final closing remarks, I think we're done. All right, we'll see you folks soon. Thank you so much, take care. Night, Hi, everyone. Thank you, have a great Bye. night. Bye, thank you. <laughs>